So we are the Venus Wind Harvest team, and my name is Vladimir Rzhanovsky. My teammates are Osvaldo Castro, Jeffrey Kim, Esteban Hernandez, and Felix Aven. Next slide. This is a Gantt chart showing our schedule. We were on track with everything until COVID started, after which we primarily focused on waterbed fabrication. Next slide. First, I will give some background for this project, state our objective, and outline the requirements for our design. Then I will explain the logic that we use to approach this project in the programmatic section, after which Felix will take over and introduce some aerodynamic concepts that we use to create our designs, and then he'll elaborate on our design approach and the nature of our designs. Uh, Esteban will then show how we manufactured our designs for testing, and Osvaldo will talk about wind tunnel testing, which informs our approach to water testing development that Jeffrey will then explain. And finally, Jeffrey will then conclude with what we have accomplished and recommendations for future work. Next slide. Venus is closer to Earth than Mars, but relative to Mars, little is known about it. This is due to its high temperature and corrosive atmosphere, which prevents the use of electronics and therefore solar panels. This presents the question, how does one power a Venetian rover? JPL is asking us to develop a turbine that can power a rover mechanically. Next slide. The focus of this year's team was to develop design methodologies, testing procedures, and water testing capabilities, all so that we can design a wind turbine that meets requirements. Next slide. Our design must be storable in a cylinder that is a half meter thick and two meters in diameter, it must weigh less than 45 kilograms and must generate 10 watts of power at an efficiency of 40% or greater, given an average wind speed of 0.6 meters per second. For context, the expected wind speed range on Venus is 0.3 to 1.3 meters per second. And this is all to be done at a budget less than $2,000. Next slide. Having described the background objective and requirements, I can now explain the logic behind how we spend our time. Next slide. Designing turbines was a primary focus last semester. What framed most of our decision this semester was the need for experimental data to verify the efficiency of our designs. Experiments that exactly replicate Venus conditions are extremely difficult to set up. So we have to find ways of connecting experimental data taken at small scales and air and water. We use the concept of Reynolds number to do this. Reynolds number characterizes the fluid flow over a body. It accounts for the velocity of a fluid, its kinematic viscosity, and the length characterizing that body, in this case, the turbine. In this table, it is shown that wind tunnel speeds needed to achieve conditions comparable to Venus are unrealistically high. So the purpose of wind tunnel testing became not to evaluate our designs, but to develop testing procedures for conditions more comparable to Venus. Developing a test with such conditions became our primary focus. So we developed water testing at a larger scale than the COCLA wind tunnel. In short, our progression was to develop designs, develop testing procedures in the wind tunnel, and finally creating water testing capabilities. Next slide. Having explained the logic for how we spent our time, Felix will now introduce the aerodynamic concepts we use to approach the design of turbines, as well as the nature of our designs. So the aerodynamics was used to help us understand how a fl fluid flows along a body to generate lift and drag. Consider the case where someone puts their hand out in the window of a moving car. The orientation of the hand and its shape determines how it will react to the wind. The upward force acting on the palm as it, as it is per perpendicular to the wind, that is going to be called lift. The force pushing back parallel to the wind is called drag. The angle at which the wind hits the hand will be considered the angle of attack. Incorporating these concepts of lift, drag, and angle of attack are used to design the geometry of, an, of our airfoil. Next slide. In the left picture, you can see the skeleton of the blade. The airfoil is the cross section of the blade. We, we cut up the, the blades into 11 sections to have a control of 1 tenth of the blade. The airfoils within the blade will determine how the blade creates lift drag and efficiency of the turbine. Next slide. The airfoil selection process began at airfoiltools.com. 
It's a database of tested airfoils. The main focus was to maximize lift to drag ratio of the airfoil we are selecting. The higher the ratio, the turbine can start rotating at lower speeds. This is essential for the turbine to operate in Venus conditions due to its low speeds. On the right side of the table, you can see a visual of the airfoil in a 2D view from Cubelade. Next slide. To design the turbine blade, we use an established tool called Cubelade. Cubelade has a built-in optimization feature. It allows us to optimize the angle of twist of the blade and also the core lengths. This optima optimization method consists of the t on the TSR. The TSR is the tip speed ratio of the rotational speed at the tip of the blade to the speed of the incoming wind. The number of blades within the turbine have an optimal TSR range for the turbine to work efficiently. For example, the four blade turbine TSR ranges from three to five, and for the three blade, it ranges from six to eight. We plug these optimal ranges into Cubelate to calculate the optimal core lengths and twist angles for our designs. Next slide. These are the designs of the turbines, turbine blades of an arrow one, two, three, and four. Our design approach is to maximize the effectiveness of airfoils within the blade and it was cut into 11 sections. Manera 1 consisted of three different NACA airfoils and were distributed one third along the blade. Manera 2 consisted of two airfoils. Majority of the blade is a NACA airfoil and the tip of the blade is SG6042. For Manera 3 and 4, the core lengths of Manera 1 and 2 have been increased to have a larger surface area to capture more energy from the wind. Next slide. These are the CAD models for the turbine that are going to get 3D printed and tested in the wind tunnel. The turbines have a diameter of 6 inches. As previously noted, the core lengths were increased for Venera 3 and 4. Next slide. Now Esteban will be talking about manufacturing and fabrication processes we did on the turbines. Alrighty, so the very first step of uh, processing our 3D printed part uh, is to obviously sand it down. Uh, in the image to the right, you can see that the left plate is what a non-processed part looks like. Uh, do keep in mind that this looks uh, really good because these parts were outsourced with a professional company, but we did not have this type of uh, quality uh, throughout the year. Uh, the 3D printers at school provided parts that had um, more surface imperfections, uh, as well as even some uh, jagged blade edges, so we obviously had to remove those. Uh, we first hit them with the 80 grit sandpaper and then we later refined them with the 220 grit sandpaper uh, to give it a smoother surface finish. Uh, and as you can see, the blade on the right side is the one that has uh, been sanded down. Uh, next slide. So in order to uh, further refine our parts, we used acetone, which is an organic compound. And we used this to dissolve the surface of the print, which ultimately um, evened out the surface and it leaves it with a nice uh, smooth layer. Uh, we actually had three methods of going about using this chemical, and uh, the first one is the acetone vapor bath. Uh, this method completely envelops the part um, in a closed container, uh, and it had a uh, wet um, acetone drenched paper towels uh, around the circumference, to, uh, which later evaporated into the container atmosphere and uh, processed our part for us. The next method is the acetone dip method, um, which has some, uh, the part come in direct contact with the acetone. Uh, from anywhere to from 30 to 45 seconds. The bottom middle image shows the unprocessed part before the acetone dip and the bottom right image shows uh, after the acetone dip, which uh, you can see has a smooth uh, and even surface. Next slide. So for the, uh, all right, so now for our last process, we, ac we actually did a acetone wipe method, uh, which is actually very simple to do. All we had to do for this uh, was put on a mask and some gloves, and then we had to take some paper towels and proceed to wet them with acetone. And we basically just wipe away at the surface, uh, applying even amounts of pressure. This method had a uh, high control and actually used the least amount of acetone uh, when processing our 3D parts. Uh, the table below shows how we score these methods when compared to each other. So for the acetone vapor bath, we can see that it got a mediocre score and this is because it was very difficult to see the surface of the print uh, because of the evaporated acetone inside the container. We can also see how we got a poor score for amount of acetone used. And this was because we really had to drench those paper towels around the, uh, the circumference uh, with acetone. 
And as for the speed, um, we got a bad score because uh, this process took anywhere from an hour and a half uh, to two hours to process a single part. As for the acetone dip method, the speed of the processing was the, the best. Um, this was because it literally took a couple of seconds to process. It received a mediocre score for the amount of acetone used uh, when compared to the other two and a poor rating for quality control because uh, if you went under or over a couple of seconds, you would literally end up with a different uh, part. Um, so as for the acetone white method, um, it received the overall best score because uh, this was due to the highest amount of quality control. Uh, you could visibly see and feel if an area needed uh, more uh, wiping uh, than another and focus on that even if uh, uh, to even out the surface. Uh, again, this method used the smallest amount of acetone and I had a mediocre score for speed because the acetone dip took seconds. This one took a couple of minutes to do, which is actually not bad at all. Uh, next slide. So I'll now be passing it on to Osvaldo, who's going to be talking about the wind tunnel testing. All right, so in order to observe the performance of the turbine, um, we first need to characterize a DC motor before testing the turbine. So here we have a conceptual setup where a uh, power supply will drive a DC motor with uh, known performance data. And um, it will drive a generator through a coupler. And, um, and so the coupler is just to ensure that both the motor and the generator are spinning at the same RPM. And uh, also the generator is attached to a ten ohm resistor where it's connected through uh, two multimeters and uh, it will read an output current and uh, voltage. Next slide. So initially we used the previous team's test bed on the left here, but we had an issue where it required more power to get the, the motors rotating and uh, we had lots of vibration. So we figured that the motors were not aligned correctly. So uh, the coupler was not really helping at all. So we decided to 3D print a, a new platform, as you can see here on the right, um, one where the motor case will align the, the motors uh, nicely, and it would allow us to clamp it down. And then we also used a, a gorilla, ta gorilla tape to act like a uh, flexible coupler so that we can uh, avoid as much vibration as possible. Next slide. So um, here's our final setup for the motor characterization. And um, again, this is just the purpose of the characterizing uh, here is just to determine the, the torque and the RPM at, uh, at different current ranges for, for the wind tunnel experiments. Uh, next slide. Um, so as you can see here, we have uh, the torque and RPM from, from various trials and motors. And this is just to ensure uh, consistency. And uh, so we obtained the characteristic equations from these trend lines, as you can see boxed here. And um, this will be used in the wind tunnel experiments just so we can calculate the mechanical power generated from the, from the wind turbine. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so on the left here, we have a conceptual diagram of the, of the wind tunnel setup. Um, it's, as you can see, it's very similar to the motor characterization setup, but the only difference here is that we have to induce airflow onto the turbine and that will drive uh, a, genera a generator. Uh, next slide. So during the first few trials, we noticed that vibration affected our results at a uh, higher wind speeds. And so we, we decided to 3D print a support for the pose that you can see here on the left. Um, and so decreasing the vibration allowed us to have um, sort of a, a wider range of, of data. And um, another issue from the wind tunnel is, is that our Venera 1 and Venera 2 had very thin blades. And so the blades would kind of bend and would sometimes break in the, in the wind tunnel. Um, so most of our uh, testing consists of Venera 3 and Venera 4, which I will show in the next few slides. Next slide, please. And so here we have uh, an efficiency comparison of the three blade and four blade turbines uh, for the Venera 3. Um, but the main takeaway from this is that um, what I have boxed in here. Um, so this shows the best mechanical power to uh, wind power ratio. And so the optimal turbine here was the uh, four blade at approximately 19% uh, efficiency. Uh, next slide. And so here we did the same efficiency comparison for Venera 4. Um, and it turns out that the uh, optimal turbine was the four blade at uh, approximately 20% uh, uh, efficiency. Next slide. And so we decided to compare the Venera 3 with Venera 4. Um, and it turns out that the turbines with four blades perform better than the three blades. And, um, and also Venera 4 uh, was the best one out of all for, yeah, for the four blade. 
And so one thing we learned from the, oh, hold on, hold on. Uh, so yeah, so one thing we learned from the wind tunnel is that we're limited with scaling and wind speed range um, in order to match the, the Venus uh, wind speeds. Um, and so through dimensional analysis, we, we figured a, a water testing environment would be like more realistic and Venera 4 would be the turbine to test, to test on water because um, we think it was the most efficient. Next slide. And so here on the left, we have an, an exploded view of the water turbine. Um, and it consists of three components and which consist of the dome, the hub, and the turbine blades. And, you know, and all the three components will be bolted down into the hub. Um, and on the right side here is when the turbine is all assembled and it will have a uh, diameter of two feet. Next slide. So now I'll we'll pass it on to Jeffrey who will talk about the water test bed. Thank you, Ozzy. Uh, to begin our design for the water test bed, we applied a stress analysis on the turbine blade uh, under water conditions using uh, SOLIDWORKS. Uh, we calculated the drag force to be around 32.5 newtons per meter, or basically a concentrated stress of 8.62 newtons at the center of the blade using one meters per second as the uh, guideline. Uh, as you can see, the uh, maximum stress came out to be 6.5 times 10 to the 6 newton, new, newton per meter squared, which is under the yield strength. And uh, maximum displacement is around 0 0.05 inches, which is small and negligible. So here is the top and side view of our uh, water test bed concept, which consists of a pool noodle, wood, and wire. And this will be constructed to be pulled across of a swimming pool. So to begin the construction, we created our bill of materials, which sums up to be around $350 uh, to construct our design, where you can see our CAD model on the right. Here, uh, we considered that the wire may actually cut through the pool noodles. So we used uh, PVC pipes and um, plastic wrap wires to ensure like a smooth uh, translation, as well as an adjustable aluminum post to allow the placement of the turbine um, at higher or lower depths of water. So during our construction, we began a buoyancy test and a mobility test. Starting off with the first video, it could be seen that it floats just fine, but uh, half of the video, uh, half of the sub, uh, half of the pool noodle is uh, submerged and it actually becomes a bit of a problem uh, when you try to do a mobility test. As you can see with a constant push, it becomes, uh, it becomes submerged at the front area. Therefore, we improved the design by shifting the platform to the rear uh, to counteract the moment produced by the drag force. And we also increased the number of pool noodles. So in this video, you can see the front of the, is uh, above the water while the rear is actually submerged. Um, we thought this would help with the, our mobility test, but despite that, it's still submerged at greater speeds. So we fixed that by adding a rope in the rear in this video to uh, help stabilize it, and it helps actually quite well. So here we are demonstrating our next, uh, using our Venera 4 4 blade uh, design, um, and we did it in the swimming pool. Oops. Silence that. Uh, we are collecting the uh, current voltage uh, using multimeters on top of the box, which you see in the first video. And we are also collecting the RPM using the second video, using that black mark on the turbine. So based on our data, we, uh, we were able to collect the current voltage and angular velocity, and you can see that it has a fairly linear relationship. Uh, however, the only reason why we don't have the mechanical efficiency is because we weren't able to characterize the motor used for this data set. But the good news is we have the data, so once we characterize the motor, the mechanical efficiency can be found. So I will finalize by talking about the conclusion and the future works. So for the requirements, um, as mentioned before, due to the limita limitations of the wind tunnel, uh, many of the requirements were, uh, uh, were not able to be achieved. Um, we believe that the uh, storing constraint and the mass constraint can be definitely matched if we had uh, more designs to be tested using our water test bed instead of the uh, wind tunnel. Uh, we also believe that the maximum efficiency of around 20% can be projected around to be five watts using um, uh, 0.6 meters per second on Venus condition as the average. And uh, we believe the, oh, we also have uh, an issue with the wind speed ratio, uh, wind speed range, because um, we didn't have a mechanism to allow the speed to go through the swimming pool as fast as we'd like, because we were actually pulling by hand. And then uh, for the budget, we were able to match having the budget under $1,000. So in conclusion, we successfully designed turbine blades with multiple airfoils instead of one. Uh, we applied dimensional analysis to match Venus conditions to test our wind turbine on Earth. Uh, we improved the methods done by previous years on the wind tunnel for collecting data, 
and tested multiple designs along with multiple trials to ensure uh, accuracy. However, discovering the limitations of wind tunnel, we, we then fabricated a platform for water testing as well as collecting data without expensive equipment. Um, we then also created a modular turbine to be tested in our test, uh, test bed with the capability of exchanging blades. So for our future works and recommendations, uh, we mentioned uh, that our design has a lot of versatility uh, and that it can be des tested into different types of body of water, such as a larger pool, a river, or in the ocean using a boat and uh, a modular pool. But we recommend the modular pool because for the convenience of usage plus the uh, price. Using the PVC skeleton structure on the left side, uh, we can insert a water tarp inside uh, and then surround it with a wooden support. This would allow, uh, this would prevent the bursting issue. Uh, the PVC structure would uh, allow the pool to be expanded and in the, any way the experimenter would like. So I'd like to um, end it with a special thanks to our uh, liaison, Dr. Jonathan Sauter, who helped us uh, um, W uh, with this situation with COVID-19 and was willing to drop off the materials and equipment to help us progress in our water test bed. I'd like to also thank our advisor, Dr. Jim Crow, who has been extremely helpful to our development as a team and in as engineers. And I would also like to thank uh, Levon Gabujian, who has been working on this project last year and acted as our mentor throughout the semester. We'd also like to thank uh, Mike Thornburn and Chris Bachman, who, who has set up the senior design experience. And last but not least, I'd like to thank my team for uh, being such a great teammates and helping out throughout the whole semester, working very hard and, you know, I, we couldn't have done it without each other. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, any questions? Okay, thank you. Um, we've got, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, does anybody want to go first? You have to unmute your microphone. I have, I have a question. I can go first. Sure. Um, so in, towards the beginning, you showed your designs that have, your four designs that have multiple airfoils in 11 segments. Did yes. you design those four designs or is that from last year? Uh, those were our design. Okay. So, so how did you choose those? Like how do you decide which airfoils to use? So uh, here I can bring it up so that we can look at it together. Um, Thanks. So uh, how we went about this, so last year's team was, uh, they actually used um, one airfoil throughout the whole cross section. Okay. Uh, and so we were recommended uh, by our advisor that um, maybe we should uh, consider having different uh, airfoils per section. So what we did was uh, we calculated the Reynolds number uh, throughout the blade and we saw what would match base, uh, based on the highest lift to, drag ratio, lift to drag ratio based on those Reynolds number and then we applied it to each section. Okay. And then related, so why is that? So normally I think that the trailing edge would be like a smooth straight line. So why are your trailing edges more wiggly? Um, you know you what mean I mean? Like at this uh, end point right here, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so initially this design on the Venera 1 and Venera 2, we're using Cubelate, um, Cubelate's optimization software that uh, optimizes the angle of attack and the cord lengths. So okay. we used that based on that and it gave us uh, an idea of where we can kind of start. And so we did collect data with these two designs and it turns out the efficiency are extremely low. So um, uh, we then we tried uh, increasing the cord length because we believe the, um, the reason why the efficiency was so low is because since we had to process these designs, it, um, it affected the shape. So we couldn't really trust Venera 1 and Venera 2's design. So we moved on to Venera 3 and Venera 4 with a higher, larger cord length, uh, which gave us, uh, which was uh, easier to process and actually gave us a bit of uh, reasonable data as you saw in the slides. Okay, thanks. Um, how did you guys measure the efficiency? So um, here, let me pull up the uh, test bed. Okay, so we first start off with generate, uh, we use a motor with ca uh, known characteristics and we combine it with the coupler to a motor that we want to characterize. Uh, we input, a, uh, input current and voltage from the power supply and that will tell us how much power input is going inside. And with the coupler in the middle or with using Gorilla tape and some uh, reflective tape, we collected the RPM. So we can see how much current is being produced and voltage with the multimeters on the right side using a 10 ohm resistor. And we're collecting the data through that and uh, we were able to collect the current based on what the RPM is. 
And we also use the known characteristics using a thing called torque constant, which allows us to relate current to torque based on the known characteristics, therefore allowing us to create a relationship with the characterized motor's current to the new torque. And thus, with this graph, we were able to use the equations to, get a, uh, to determine what kind of torque is being produced based on the characterized motor with the current being produced from the wind tunnel uh, in this image right here. So when this starts spinning, it starts turning our generator, which outputs a current. And with that current, we have a relationship to the torque. So using that torque, we're able to find the power, mechanical wind power, and we already can calculate the power in the wind. So the mechanical efficiency can be found by getting the power produced divided by the uh, power in the wind. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I have a question. Hi. Uh, the power output, power output is uh, about five five watts. You said. Yeah, projected to be five watts. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, how how can you improve it? So we believe that uh, the reason why we we uh, we designed our water test bed was so that we can um, increase our range because, uh, as you saw with the uh, this slide right here, the the related velocity range in the wind tunnel to match Venus conditions were 131 to 570 meters per second, which we cannot produce. And even if we could, the 3D prints would break. So that's why we created our water testing test bed. But since we were only able to test one design in the water test bed, uh, that was the efficiency that we were able to get. Um, we believe that if we had um, more time and more designs to apply on the water test bed, we can actually get a better reading. So your, your question is saying, how can we improve the design? I believe that we can improve the design based on the water test bed, the first uh, data points that we collected and improve the design from there by adjusting the cord length and seeing how that can improve. Because we definitely believe the Airfoils we chose had the best uh, lift to drag ratios. Mm -hmm. Okay, so probably the next uh, design team will take over uh, from your from your work, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. the, this uh, this project initially was to uh, create a design uh, and match the requirements, but it turns out that we couldn't match it because the limitations of the wind tunnel. So uh, that's why we. Uh, ended up deciding to make a water test bed so that next year's team can definitely use our test bed and improve, uh, improve on it, of course, uh, especially since the limitation of, you know, the facilities and access to, uh, because of COVID-19. So we definitely believe that um, this would uh, put a better direction for the next year's team. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Jeffrey and team. This is Monica Jacinto from Aerojet Rocketdyne. Hi. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to congratulate the team on doing a great job, very well communicated and very professional. Thank you, thank you. I had a few questions about your um, 3D printing. Yeah, sure. Was that done on campus or outside? I, I didn't quite catch oh. that. Okay, so uh, these designs right here. Okay, so when we created our initial prints, and these are only four of the designs that we created. We actually have multiple, multiple other designs, but of course um, we wanted to limit it to the ones that actually mattered. Um, we actually 3D printed at our, uh, at our campus uh, with a MakerBot, and the uh, surfaces of the um, blades were actually very rugged and jagged, and, since they're a smaller scale, it's very hard to process these 3D prints because we have to sand them. And the risk of that was that we would potentially change the airfoil shape. Um, but with this one on the ha other hand, this big size one, this is a one foot length. We actually use the website called Prozix, which is a 3D printing so uh, service online. And since we couldn't 3D print this with the current print 3D printer we had, and because we weren't at the facility, uh, we ordered this online and they were able to actually print the whole blade in itself and it came out actually very smooth. Uh, we, we then sanded it down to, uh, of course, make it better. Um, but this definitely was a nice uh, alternative because if we were to originally use the one we have, uh, we'd have to break this into sections and combine them together. Sure, yes, I, I've seen the one on campus. Um, <clears throat> did you perform any kind of inspection on these blades once they were printed? Yes, yes. So uh, when, we, uh, when we saw them, so the shape overall was actually matched the airfoil shape that we were looking for. 
um, we, we normally the edge over here, as you see, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but on the yeah. left side of this okay. image, this actually was normally very rough. It would have a bunch of like steps essentially. And normally when we were 3D printing with the MakerBot, that would mean that we'd be shaving off a, quite a bit of the airfoil versus this one actually didn't have any. This was actually very smooth. It's, it was very, it was very uh, well, well shaped in the end. The only thing that needed to be sanded down for this one were basic, the, clearly the supports that were holding the airfoil when it was being 3D printed. So you, you, your inspection was all dimensional. Did you look at the, you know, the quality of the actual metal? I'm not sure what metal was being used, but to make I'm sure sorry. there weren't any kind of um, imperfections in the metal? In, in the metal? Oh, I think it's a plastic about, print. Yeah, it's a plastic yeah. print. Yeah. Plastic oh, print. yes. <laughs> OK. I couldn't tell that from the picture. Right. Great. Thank you so much. Sorry, Mike. Yeah, sure. We'll do. <laughs> other other questions? We've still got some time. Um, I was wondering. I had a question on the um, uh, efficiency, and was wondering if you looked to see if there's a motor spec sheet at all that you could get an efficiency from, and from that sort of at least get a rough number of the efficiency for the children. Uh, for the for the water test bed or for the for the water test bed yes because you mentioned you of course because of COVID-19 you weren't able to uh test the you know do your own testing on the motor itself so I was wondering if you yeah if it was possible to um measure the uh or just find a data sheet for the motor and get the motor efficiency from that uh it wouldn't be as accurate as running the test yourself but yeah um the thing is with the the motor that we had we couldn't really um find a uh specific uh, a spec sheet for it, um, but uh, I believe that once we, we find it, we'll be able to calculate the, the efficiency. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, did that, um, what was your, uh, is there another question you had? Yeah, on these runs too, I was just curious, is each data point one run then, where you're yeah, yeah, pushing so each, it through the pool at a different speed? Yeah, so um, initially we had uh, three different speeds. Oh, well, actually, I was pulling it. So I was trying to be as consistent as possible. So velocity one was kind of like the lowest speed, and we did four trials for that. The next velocity, I pulled it at a faster faster speed. Obviously, it required a little more force. Um, then the last one is like was really um, hard, where I had to require a bunch of force just to get to uh, the same, all, for all of it to be in the same velocity, all four trials. So that's how we... Um, that's, what, uh, that's how our trials consisted of for the velocity uh, ranges. And are you accounting for drag from the water on the uh, floating vehicle at all and subtracting that from it yet? Or do you have an estimate as far as what that was? Um, as far as the drag, um, we haven't on the, uh, it, on the calculations. But um, you're talking about the, the bending, correct? Uh, no, I was just talking about drag. Like you have to worry about that influencing the although I guess you know no you know you have a known speed so never mind you don't need that yeah. piece of information. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Any other questions? Excellent. Okay. Great work. Thank you. Any other questions? I have I have if there's time I have I have two kind of quick questions that are related. So um, I assume doing a lot of a lot of uh, wind turbine stuff, you guys are familiar with BETS limit. So my first kind of question is, do you guys know, is BETS limit a function of the density of the air? And this kind of stems from my kind of wondering, usually at higher wind velocities, the wind turbines will be more efficient and at low wind velocities, they'll be less efficient. And so I wonder if like your guys is expecting to get 40%, which is a pretty good efficiency, is maybe just unrealistic considering the Reynolds numbers associated with the wind speeds at Venus. Right. Or maybe you guys kind of have penciled it out and you expect that at those Reynolds number, you could get, you could actually get 40% efficiency. I'm just wondering, you know, do you know if that's even possible really? Well, um... We, we believe that it is definitely possible, but as of this moment, we're only able to reach maybe about half of it based on the current design. Um, of course, uh, we can continue to try different designs to see if we can match it. Uh, we, do, no, we do agree that the bets limit is 59% and it's, it's very hard to even get close to 40% as is. Uh, we know that last year's teams got around 20% as well. 
And um, we definitely want to uh, continue to test this in the water test bed to see if we can actually increase it. Um, because the, this data is based on a smaller scale and um, because we potentially change the air, show, uh, air shape, we wanted to do the water test bed to see how well it matches with this data. And if it, might, it might in fact be even better, more efficient. Um, that's what we project at least. All right, that sounds cool. I'd be curious though, even for like the best wind turbines at four meters per second, what kind of efficiencies they get. Because yes, maybe you guys are doing quite good, actually. You know, twenty percent. I'm pretty impressed that at such a slow, slow speed. Yours right. is interesting that your mechanical efficiency goes down at high speeds. But right. um, I guess my other question is: Do you guys optimize the tilt angle of your blades? Because maybe there's, maybe also too, if um, if you haven't optimized the tilt angle, maybe there's something to be. There's an easy knob there to, to squeak out a few more percent. Right. Um, currently, so based on the Qblade optimization software, uh, we're able to have it uh, calculate the, the twist angle for us to give us the best uh, value. Um, but uh, we definitely wanted to uh, mess around with that if we had, uh, well, of course, more time. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome work, team. I was very, very impressed with all your analysis and getting a lot of data, both in the wind tunnel and water. So I think you guys... You guys did a really, really nice job, at least in my, in my opinion, and went above and beyond uh, this semester. Great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Okay. Well, I guess that'll about wrap it up. Um, thank you, um, team, for the work that you've done. It was a good presentation. Thanks to the audience for participating. Um, please remember to fill out the, uh, uh, the survey. Um, I put the link to the survey in the group chat. You can find it there. Um, if you can't find it, let me know and I will send out another one. Our next presentation will be Southern California Edison Seismic Vibration Team. Um, they'll get queued up uh, in the next minute or so and then we'll get started with that. One of the members of the team needs to take command of the screen. I can do that. Hey, Mike, this is Carl Salinas. That was Team 11 that just presented? Yes, it was. Yes. Team 11. Okay. okay, great, thanks. Looking at the survey now. Hello. Is the whole team here? Yes, I believe so. Hi, everyone. Okay, you guys about ready to go? Yeah. All right, so welcome to Expo 2020, our first online expo. Um, the next presentation in this session is from Southern California Edison sponsored team uh, uh, analyzing and designing fixes for seismic vibration issues at power substations. Um, so take it away, guys. Hello, everyone. I'll be uh, kicking it off today. Um, we are the seismic and wind vibration mitigation team, uh, seismic vibration 36. Um, we have uh, three uh, Southern California liaisons, uh, John Dye, Alex Lee, and Flores of Bautista. Uh, who, uh, John Dye has been our primary uh, point of contact uh, throughout our program, providing us with critical design information and support. Uh, this is a project uh, sponsored by them to address current failures at their electrical substations. We have two uh, Cal State LA advisors, Dr. Michael Thorborn and Dr. Stephen Filsegi who have offered a tremendous amount of support and guidance throughout uh, our senior design program. Our team consists of five mechanical engineering students, Luis Ayala Sierra, Doreen uh, Gray Angeles, Walter Palayo, Eduardo Zavala, and myself, Jesse Chavez Sierra. A little bit of the background, uh, 
Southern California Edison substations have certain, um, some configurations that have uh, transmissions lines that run through wave trap uh, systems that lead into a line drop counterweight restraint system. Uh, line drop counterweight restraint systems uh, were designed to counteract and stabilize uh, some of the seismic activities of California. Um, they, and they, in turn, they prevent uh, potential power outages that are caused by the mechanical failures. Uh, the wave traps themselves, uh, they filter out high frequency um, signals that can cause uh, electric, uh, electrical equipment overload. Uh, they instead redirect them uh, to a control room so that they are addressed. Uh, it's very important to note again that uh, not all the line drops uh, attached to the counterweight restraint systems uh, have wave traps. Uh, these uh, next slides, you know, they, they contain uh, two charts. Uh, one of them is the earthquake magnitude probability chart. Uh, this uh, chart, um, the Southern California Edison's uh, primary region falls above Los Angeles County and uh, right above uh, San Diego County. Uh, as we can see, uh, there is a huge uh, probability of, of earthquake and seismic activity uh, due to the faults that run through LA County and down into San Diego. Uh, there, the other chart uh, shows a, an example of one of their substations at Devers that shows uh, high wind speeds. Um, so not only do, do the, their electrical substations here at Southern California uh, run the risk of seismic uh, vibration failure, but they also, uh, certain substations have uh, high frequency uh, uh, wind vibrations that are caused by the wind loading. Uh, some of the current failures, uh, like we mentioned, at Southern California Edison's are at their current counterweight restraint system. Um, there are two configurations. Uh, one of them is uh, without a wave trap. Uh, the, the configuration without a wave trap, uh, it mitigates seismic induced vibrations, but currently fails uh, cyclic uh, wind loading vibrations. Um, the other configuration is with a wave trap. And that configuration um, is failing under both the seismic and wind loading. Uh, there are some of the types of mechanical failures that have been observed are surface fatigue, abrasive wear, and ductile fracture. Um, failure for both of the configurations um, are caused by the counterweight rod rubbing against and eroding at the retaining plate, as can see at the image provided. Um, this is another um, image of the counterweight restraint system. As you can see at the top uh, retaining plate, that is where the failure occurs as, a, as it rubs off against the top plate and eventually causes uh, the mechanical flavor of the system. A little bit of the project scope. Um, our team was uh, tasked to design, analyze, manufacture, and test a restraint system that can withstand both seismic and wind loads. We are to provide a CAD drawings for the restraint system and develop FAA and uh, models of the line drop under the new restraint system. <clears throat> Our team also uh, decided to, to develop a retrofit design solution for the current counterweight restraint system uh, where the line drop configuration does not include a wave trap. Uh, here are some of our deliverables uh, from the beginning of our design, senior design program, um, as, as you can see. Our project organization is uh, shown as is. Uh, at the top, we have our Southern California Edison Liaisons. Uh, we have our Castellari Advisors. Our team lead is Walter Pelayo. Uh, we have a design manufacturing team, Walter Pelayo, Luis Ayala Sierra. Uh, vibration analysis was performed by Dorian Gray Angelis. Uh, Simulac and ANSYS modeling uh, was performed by Eduardo Savala and technical design review and research was done by myself, Jesse Chavez. Here's a work uh, breakdown schedule of, of our tasks. Um, we have uh, three major tasks, uh, design modeling, development and prototyping. Hi guys, my name is Walter. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the requirements for this project as well as a quick overview for our new damping system and our retrofit solution. Uh, so here we can see some of the requirements for this project. Some of the more notable ones is lifespan. So, so kind of our solid core corning and Edison was pretty adamant about having a system with a lifespan of about 30 years with little to no maintenance. 
uh, another one is when loading, this would be the requirement to determine if the system is able to uh, withstand cyclic wing loading. For our retrofit system, um, we were unable to verify that uh, with testing because of the COVID-19. And for our new system, the component that actually fails due to cyclic wind, load, cyclic wind loading is actually removed altogether. So we didn't bother. Uh, now a quick overview for our damping system. Uh, so our goal for designing a, an initial concept for this system was to have a more compact design with a smaller footprint. And we accomplished that by <clears throat> uh, replacing the weights with springs. And as we did more research, our model went through several iterations till we got to our final design that you can see on the far right. Now, uh, the main differences between our final design and our initial concept is our final design uses viscous dampers. This helps to um, slow down the motion of the line drop and also um, would prevent red resonance. Uh, the springs are actually also working in compression instead of tension. Our team figured it'd be easier to restrain the springs inside the system instead of coming up with some elaborate way of attaching them to the system. And also the final design is an enclosed system. So this helps protect, uh, protect the internal components from uh, the weather as well as large debris that can get in there and interfere with the operations of the system. Uh, we're looking at springs for the system. We found Century Spring Corporation and we found this specific model. So this has a, a max load rating of about 400 pounds and with four, that's about 1600 pounds, which is almost double what the current system's doing. It also has a spring rate of about 50 pounds per inch. So at four, that uh, gets us about 200. And this is uh, beneficial because once the springs are installed and preloaded uh, under small loads, the system behaves as a solid state bracing system. So we don't see any of that abrasive wear. And under large loads, the system becomes dynamic. So it behaves more as a vibration suppression system. Um, when looking for dampers, we found ACE controls. Um, again, uh, the damper system, uh, the damper's job is to slow down the motion and prevent resonance. Um, ACE controls um, claims a life of 250,000 cycles, as well as forces up to 2,200 pounds, strokes of over 30 inches, uh, temperatures of over 170 degrees Fahrenheit. So essentially we can get a damper built that far exceeds our, uh, our necess uh, necessities. Um, to calculate the life, for this, uh, the life that we need for this damper, we came up with a very conservative estimate of one cycle per hour, and then over 30 years, like it was 260,000 cycles. So under the most extreme conditions for 30 years straight, the damper would not survive, but under more realistic and moderate uh, conditions, we're confident that the damper would have sufficient life. Uh, now, as far as the budget, the entire system would cost us just under $1,500, but this is only the cost of the raw materials and the components. Uh, there's also a considerable cost of actually manufacturing the prototype or the one that would go out in the field and also installation. Uh, we have no real meaningful, meaningful way of calculating that. Now, a quick overview for our uh, retrofit solution. So again, the retrofit solution is only applicable in the configuration where the line drop does not have a weight trap. In this configuration, we see the uh, failure only comes for the cyclic wind loading. So we decided to come up with a cheaper solution and an easier way to implement that solution uh, by just addressing the symptom. And we did that by um, uh, deciding to install a linear bearing. Now, a linear bearing would limit the rod to only one degree of motion, so we don't see any wear from impact. Also, that motion is smooth, so we don't get any of that abrasive wear that's actually causing the failure. This uh, specific model is also flanged, so it makes it a lot easier to install. As far as performance, this is rated for over 1,300 pounds of dynamic loading, which is far more than we expect to see from wind. Uh, it's also self-aligning and corrosive resistance, so we can leave this outside and not really have to worry about it. Uh, when trying to calculate the light that we would actually need from the linear bearing, uh, we came up with a very conservative estimate of uh, 10 inches of travel every hour, and then over 30 years, that gave us 2.6 million inches of travel. Now, when trying to calculate the life that we could actually get out of this linear bearing, uh, the manufacturer provides a very useful uh, equation that takes into consideration the, the kind of loading, where the load is being applied, the hardness of the shaft, and taking the worst case scenario, we got about 2.3 million inches of travel. Uh, so over 30 years under the worst case scenario, uh, it would not survive 30 years. But again, under more realistic and 
moderate conditions, uh, we're confident that the product would actually survive and have sufficiently long life. Now over to Dorian. Uh, hello, I'm going to be going over the analysis of our damper system. So here we have our, uh, our the model we used for our, for our, for our line drop. Uh, we have mass one, which would represent our, our wave trap. And if you know, there's a, there's a mass two here. Our final design did not, uh, did not make use of a, of a counterweight. But the model we the model we created it has the capabilities of of introducing one if we if we wanted to see the the differences with and without a counterweight. These K three and K two represent con, uh, horizontal conductors that are attached to the line drop. These conductors, although not actual springs, provide stiffness that'll help. That, that helps stabilize the line drop when it when it's excited. Uh, for so, A and B uh, figures A and B represent our line drop at equilibrium and when it is, when it's excited. When the wave when the wave trap begins to swing, mass mass two or in our case just the uh, the spring and the damper become activated and there's a vertical displacement in Y. Uh, figures C and D represent the free body diagrams for mass one and mass two. To, to estimate the, the distance that, that the wave trap travels, we use the arc, we use the arc length times the stiffness of that conductor to get the force, to get the forces that were applied to the, to the line drop. For mass two, since, since since mass two is restricted to only vertical motion, we did not take into account any horizontal forces there. Continue. So here we have the equations of motion that we developed for mass one and mass two, where beta is is a function of theta is a function of theta. Uh, these for for a. Uh, for mass one, we added the forces in the tangent in the tangential direction, and and we we treated for simplicity we treated the forces from the conductors to act on the mass uh, perpendicular to its motion. For mass two, we only again we only considered vertical forces because the system was restrained to that to only vertical displacement. Upon rearranging these equations for theta double dot and y double dot we were able to create a simulink model. Okay. So here's a schematic of our simulink model where both equations were placed into one schematic connected to scopes that would yield our theta double dot and our y double dot. And so by that, I mean the, our angular acceleration and our vertical acceleration. Uh, and I'll go back. Uh, here, the, the sections that you see circled are our inputs, so that would be K1, K2, our masses, the, the tension in the line drop. See. Okay, so now when it came to defining the stiffness of the horizontal conductors, we, we faced some difficulty. Since they're not true springs, there was no rated stiffness for them. We investigated what last year's team did, and they approx they estimated the stiffness using an equation for stiffness in a beam that's in tension or compression. Uh, upon further investigation, we noted that last year's last year's team only accounted for when it came to Young's modulus, they only accounted for the effect of the aluminum. The conductor is uh, is composed of eighty four aluminum strands with a with a steel core of, of 19 strands. So they, they used 1.2 times 10 to the six uh, PSI, which was very low compared to, uh, to published values. So right here, we, this is uh, from the American Society of Metals for, for 1350 H19 aluminum, and that's the aluminum that's used in the conductors. And their, their Young's modulus is listed as 10 to the six. So the Young's modulus they, they used is a whole power of 10 less. 
In addition to that, for the cross-sectional area, they only use the cross-sectional area of a single aluminum strand and not the 84 strands that the conductor is composed of. This resulted in a K2 of 1.4 times 10 to the 3 and a, a K3 of 967 pounds per foot. In an effort to better estimate these values, we used a, a Young's modulus that took into account the, the contributions of both the aluminum and the steel and the steel of strands. Uh, this number was, this value was, uh, was pulled from, uh, from, from G&E's testing on, on, SA, on SoCal Edison's line drop, line drop systems. They, they estimated that an equivalent Young's modulus taking into account both, both the, the aluminum and the steel would be 29 times 10 to the six PSI. For the cross-sectional area, we took into account all 84 strands of aluminum and 19 strands of, of steel. This, this however, yielded, yielded values that were extremely high, almost 10,000 times the magnitude of last year's team. So con con taking that into account and considering the fact that the conductors actually have slack and are not stiff beams, this approach to estimate the, the stiffness is fundamentally flawed and will give us a very, will give us num numbers far higher than is truly, um, than we, that, that we should truly expect on, on the field. So there's still, we're still doing further analysis, trying to better estimate these values using a strain energy approach, relating the deflection based on an applied force for the specific geometries of K2 and K3. K, K2, K2 has an S, an S bend, and K3 is more of a like quarter circle. So continue. So here we have the uh, a time history that, you, that we used for uh, to test to test our system. This is a horizontal time history that site for provided by S S SoCal Edison. It's a uh, it meets seismic qualification standards per IEEE for design analysis. Uh, this time history is filtered with a with a corner with a corner high pass filter at 0.15 hertz and reduced the peak displacement to 28 inches, the peak velocity to 93 inches per second, and the peak ground acceleration to 1.3 g's. Did okay, so. One of the restraints that we used for for design for obtaining the parameters of our system was that we wanted to ensure that our springs and dash and dash pots did not bottom out. That is, that they didn't completely compress, um, causing impact loads at our at the foundation. So one of our constraints was achieving a a to not ex, not exceeding the a vertical a maximum vertical displacement. Uh, for, for this analysis, we also opted to not include the horizontal conductors due to our inability to, accu to accurately estimate their stiffness. Considering that adding them in would provide more restoring forces, these results could be, could, could be further improved. With our, with our chosen parameters for the system, we were able to achieve a peak vertical displacement of about six inches. Continue. Okay, so so using with with that restriction in in the this in the vertical y displacement, we that that in turn resulted in a maximum angular displacement of about four point four point one degrees. This these, this five degree displacement translates to a maximum displacement of about five feet for the wave trap. This is similar to last year's. To what last year was able to achieve, where they, where their maximum displacement was about six degrees, with a maximum displacement of, of about five and a half feet. Further analysis is still needed to be, is still needed to be completed with respect to any impact forces that would result at the bus connections in the event that all the available slack in the conductors was used. 
these since these connections are only rated for 200 for up to 2000 pounds under dynamic loading our analysis however did not we, we we never made it to that stage to to analyze the forces at the foundation at the foundational posts and the bus connectors so that'll be the end of the uh, of an analysis for our damper system i would like to pass it on to to Luis to go over the analysis of our retrofit system uh hello everyone my name is Luis, and i'll be going over the analysis of the retrofit system so for our retrofit system, instead of um, doing a computerized simulation, we decided to instead do a live testing simulation. The objective of our test was to verify that the wind loading was, the, was the, actually the cause of the non-wave trap system's failure, and to also verify the effectiveness of our linear bearing solution. So the main testing components in our, uh, for our testing were two galvanized steel rods that we cut down to five feet, Two, uh, two galvanized steel plates and four 67 pound weights that were all provided to us by Edison. We also used a Thompson linear bearing, a camera to record the testing. And we were going to use a heavy duty drill or a three kilowatt VLDC motor to power the slider crank. So for our original design, our plan was to place the galvanized steel plate on the center plate holder that you see there. Uh, once that was in, uh, securely attached, we also drilled two holes into the, each of the rods in order to be able to connect them to the slider crank connector. Um, two screws were going to be used to secure it, and that was going to allow for the slider crank and the rod to still have the angle needed for when it's rotating, for when the slider crank is rotating. For this configuration, the weights were going to be placed onto the rod, and they were going to be securely um, attached uh, with the use of a total of four clamps that we manufactured. And this configuration was going to be powered by a heavy duty drill. So as I mentioned previously, our goal for that design was to uh, restrain the plate in the centerpiece. To do so, we needed to make two one eighth by one inch cuts on, into the plate. And also for one of the plates, we only we needed to make four holes in order to securely attach the linear bearing. Due to some concerns uh, that our advisors and liaisons had about our previous design being able to withstand the loads throughout the entirety of the test, we decided to go ahead and make an alternative model. Uh, this alternative model, our, our purpose was to provide uh, more support and rigidity to our apparatus. Therefore, we added two rollers to help guide the, the rod and support it better. We still kept a centerpiece uh, rest uh, plate restraint but this plate restraint offered more uh, stability than the previous one. Also for this uh, design, uh, the three kilowatt BLDC motor was going to be used in order for us to be able to better regulate the speed. Um, and for this design, the plate was gonna be suspended off of the rod and the weights were gonna be suspended off of the plate with the use of a hook system. And due to the weight, the rod not having to carry the weights back and forth as the previous design did, um, the required torque and power actually uh, reduced compared to the previous design. So uh, as I mentioned previously, we were going to use a uh, weight holder that was gonna hook onto the holes of the plate. Um, that bottom piece was gonna be unscrewed in order to attach the, insert the weights, and then it was gonna be screwed back on to secure them in place. Fortunately, we still had enough time to build the alternative model. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, the our purpose for this model was to give it more rigidity and support. So we used a total of eight steel L bars for the structure pieces and we connected each of the structure pieces with a steel, uh, with steel bar. Um, we also modified two caster wheels in order to be able to use them as our rollers. Next. So for our live testing, we were planning to, for our first test to be done with the use of, a, of, the, gal of the linear bearing installed on the galvanized steel plate. And the second test was gonna be done without the linear bearing installed on the plate. Both tests were going to be ran continuously for approximately uh, for 10 hours in order to simulate approximately six months of wear under the most extreme conditions. Uh, we decided to do under the most extreme conditions because we believe that if the linear bearing was able to sustain these extreme conditions, then once it was gonna be installed out in the field, 
it would be able to, it would have a higher probability of sustaining the loads under normal conditions out in the field. Um, also for, for each test, the plate and rod thickness measurements were going to be taken before and after in order to be able to analyze the wear and determine if indeed the linear bearing provided the necessary wear, abrasive wear resistance that we needed. Um, a camera recorder was going to be set to capture the final two hours of each test uh, especially the second test, which is the one that's used without the linear bearing. Um, we wanted to be able to, if in case the rod or the plate did fail, just like it does out in the field, we wanted to be able to capture that on video to further analyze it and better understand how it is that it's failing out in the field. Uh, unfortunately, we were not able to proceed with the testing due to the uh, pandemic situation. So we were not able to verify our retrofit solution. Thank you. Eduardo, you're yeah. muted. I'm going to be talking about the FDA models of the, of the system that we created. So this is uh, an FDA model of the original testing setup. And the program that was used to model the system was ANSYS, which more specifically structure, static structural. The model here shows the total deformation that will have occurred during the testing process uh, based on the location of the plate. So this is a close up of the area that would have been affected the most by the placement of the weights on top of within the rod and the plate itself. You can see that there is significant bending on the rod. And here is a video of the simulation that uh, I conducted. Uh, the next slide. So this is a model of the new system and what it would look like. Unfortunately, due to some limitation of the simulation, I was not able to get a complete analysis of it. So there was some drawbacks. Uh, fortunately, I was able to uh, simulate on one spring within the system and that will represent each individual spring. Uh, I used a, an estimated force to be able to determine how much displacement that the spring would have. And uh, since there will be multiple springs, it, it would take into account uh, a greater amount of force. The total amount of this deflection that I got with the spring was uh, 0.03 meters with the load that was used. Jesse? You're on mute. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. Uh, this is our risk uh, consequence uh, chart. Uh, this is a probability of occurrence versus consequent risk. Uh, we have addressed um, uh, four different types of risks uh, when we're uh, designing our, our new restraint system and our retrofit systems. Um, these are labeled from most um, to least impactful. Uh, one of them our most uh, impactful risk or one that we wanted to address when we were designing was uh, a resonance. For resonance, we wanted to, uh, we wanted to mitigate the probability of res a resonance uh, for our new restraint system specifically. Uh, so that underwent a couple of different design changes as uh, Walter mentioned. Um, it went from initially having no dampers uh, to now including uh, four viscous dampers along with the springs. Uh, connection to failures would be addressed by the same uh, system um, and uh, along with uh, weather and leaner bearing being uh, the least impactful of our systems. Uh, brief summary, you know, in conclusion, we were able to uh, successfully design uh, the new line drop restraint system uh, that would mitigate seismic induced vibrations that cause failure uh, to the current counterweight system under the wave trap configuration. Uh, we were also able to design a retrofit design solution for the retaining plates for the current counterweight restraint system. And that would be used uh, to mitigate the effects of cyclic weight loading vibrations uh, that currently cause the failure at the top plate and rod. Uh, 
in order to verify that uh, for, for the retrofit design solution, uh, we did design successfully design and built a, a test apparatus. Uh, unfortunately, like we mentioned, we weren't due to the current you know COVID nineteen pandemic. We were able, we weren't able to complete uh, testing and some of the accommodations that were required for the specimen that we received from Southern California says uh, were unable to be uh, uh, you know addressed as well. And you know regarding that, you know. Uh, our testing was uh, considered inconclusive. Any questions? Okay, thank you, team. Um, so we do have some time for questions. Um, who would like to go first? Hi, gentlemen. I have some question. Hello. Yes. Hi. Hi. Proceed. Okay. Uh, uh, you guys have a kind of a good est estimation. It seems to me good estimation for the equivalent spring constant of the horizontal conductor. I think uh, you have kind of a better estimation. Uh, the number is pretty good. Pretty, I, I think pretty huge, huge number. So I think uh, that's, uh, uh, if that is a, a close to practical uh, real, real life situation, then that, that, that is great. Uh, so your design, uh, you guys, uh, uh, you guys recommendation is uh, uh, the design without wave trap or with a wave, wave trap, without wave, wave, uh, without wave, wave trap, right? So without the wave trap, uh, the retrofit solution would be used just because it's easier and uh, to, you know, it's cheaper and easier to implement. Now with the configuration with the wave trap, a new restraint, restraint system would be needed because under that configuration, it's fairly under a seismic activity. So the new restraining yeah. system would address that. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Okay, good. But uh, do you have kind of a, uh, a performance check about with wave trap and without wave trap kind of comparison? Uh, how do you, how can you have a confidence uh, in that direction? Uh, so you mean confidence in that we know how it's failing? I, I, no, no, I mean the kind of a performance or analysis kind of comparison between with wave trap and without without wave trap. Okay, so without the wave trap, we were gonna yeah. verify using that, uh, using the test apparatus. Uh, Fortunately, we weren't able to do that. Now we know that the configuration without the wave trap can survive seismic activity because Southern California, Southern California Edison did do testing and uh, that did survive seismic activity up to one PGA. Now okay. with the wave trap, we were going to test that. Well, we tested that using a math model. It's still a little bit inconclusive, but um, so the California Edison did do testing on that condition too, and that didn't pass. Does that okay. answer your question? Oh uh, yeah. So uh, you guys have kind of a uh, kind of a direction, okay? So your direction is your suggestion is uh, without wave trap, right? Yes. So so this uh, design solution would be uh, for the new restraint system would be for um, with the wave trap and without the wave trap, um, we, would, uh, we would introduce the uh, d retrofit design system. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, you guys introduced a kind of a linear bushing bearing. Uh, where, where did you install the, where, where can you install the linear bushing bearing? Correct. Uh, Go ahead, Walter. Uh, we're planning to install it on the top guide plate, so. If you go back to the top. Basically on this plate, which goes essentially there, but uh, let's see. There, where you see that plate, it would be installed in there. Okay, all right. So, so that, that, that picture shows uh, the current failure at the top post. So the um, linear bearing of uh, a uh, bushing would go at right there at the top plate uh, to alleviate the, the rubbing. Okay. Like a, the whole purpose of the retrofit solution was to specifically address the symptom of the problem. So we were specific. able to do a, a site walk. Uh, fortunately, we were. We went to a uh, a substation close by to Cal State LA, uh, makes a substation. Uh, we were able to identify that even under normal wind loading, we were able to notice that there was rubbing against the plate, um, and that it was and that is a relatively new substation, electrical substation. So as soon as we noticed that, uh, that was our first uh, initial uh, suggestion for Southern California Edison that we would uh, address that uh, with a retrofit design. Mm -hmm. 
And also another question I have is in your FA model, um, FA model, the CAD model, the original CAD model, uh, you guys created CAD model or the CAD model was uh, given from the uh, uh, Southern California Edison? No, we designed all these ourselves. Okay. So what's the material or uh, are you using for the wire, wire model? I'm sorry, the wire model? Mm -hmm. Wire, your FA. Go ahead, Eduardo. I think you might cover this. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, this is no, he, he needs the other one. Uh, keep going. No, the one more. Yeah, that one. Right? No, no, previous one. Oh. Yeah. So, this wire is uh, just the uh, same material? Here? Uh, yes, it was. The, the rod and the weights and the plate itself, uh, we counted for the material when we're designing it. Th those okay. were provided um, to us from Col uh, Southern California Edison. Um, yes, John yes. Dye from SE, he provided those, uh, the exact uh, plates that, that are currently used for their systems at their electrical substations. Okay. Yeah, so that they were all galvanized steel. Okay, cool. Okay, we've got maybe time for one more question. Anybody else have a question? Okay, if not, well, congratulations team. Um, job well done. Um, everybody be sure and look for the Qualtrics survey. Um, if you can have the link, I posted it in the chat room. Um, we're, we're interested in your feedback. Um, we're interested in feedback from students, faculty, and visitors alike. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Great time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Our next presentation, um, I think I see that all the team members are here. Okay. Need to bear with me. Let me. So somebody from the next team needs to grab the uh, screen to share. I got it. Can we see? Thank you, we've got it. All right, so the next presentation is from the biomedical sector, it's um, a phlebotomous arm for nurse practice. Um, and without further ado, then let me uh, let you guys get started. All right, everyone ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Ready? Ready. Yeah. All right, here we go. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our final design review. Uh, we are Team 24, and we're working on the phlebotomist arm for nursing practice. Our advisor is Matthias Brew. Our liaison is Dr. Williams with the Cal State LA Nursing Department. And these are my fellow teammates. Go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Susana Corsios. I'm Minerva Miramonte. I'm Paulino Corona. I'm Saeed Malasai Jeffrey. And I'm Victor Gomez. Uh, now I'll let Minerva go ahead and take over the introduction of this uh, presentation. Thank you, Victor. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'll be introducing the background of our project. Next slide, please. And I'd like to start off by telling you that a phlebotomist arm is a great tool which is primarily used in the medical field for future nurses to practice their needle insertion techniques while being risk-free of ethical issues. The ideal features for a phlebotomist arm include mimicking human skin and blood pressure, as well as having anatomically correct vein placement. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, currently the nursing department is using an unrealistic phlebotomist arm because the veins are irreplaceable, which causes the materials to decay and to leak. And currently the skin does not provide good optical or mechanical properties to mimic human skin. Since once one nursing student punctured the skin sleeve, 
the whole of the needle is left behind. And this provides a guide for the next student to know where to puncture. Because of this, the nursing department has to replace the skin sleeve. And this takes a long time to do and it is also expensive. So they actually end up buying a brand new dummy arm. Next slide, please. And to resolve these issues, we developed a universal skin sheet that mimics human skin in its optical and harness shore aid properties with a blood pressure system which ranges between the normal human blood pressure. And it also has anatomically correct vein placement with the rolling vein feature. All of this was accomplished affordably and it is maintainable. And now I'll go ahead and let Susana take over the presentation. Okay, thank you Minerva. So I'll be going over the scope, the requirements and the team organization for our project. Moving on to the next slide. So as Minerva had previously stated, there were many issues that we found with the current dummy arm that were also specified by our client. And once we identified all of these issues, we were then able to define the scope of our project. So as you can see here on this slide, we sectioned off our project into four different categories, which includes the design, the skin, the veins, and the blood pressure system. And all of these four are tied in by our data analysis for this project. So for the design, we wanted to develop a dummy arm that was overall more realistic in terms of the skin and the veins. We also wanted it to be easily maintainable for the nursing department by having the skin and the veins be easily removable and easily replaceable at an affordable cost. We also wanted the veins to have a more realistic placement on the arm in regards to the vein routing system. And we also want to incorporate a blood pressure system into our design to add even more realism to the dummy arm. So moving on to the next slide. Here we have a list of our functional as well as our performance requirements. Again, one of the main goals for this project was to develop an arm that is overall more realistic in comparison to the one that is currently being used. And in order for us to achieve this goal, we decided that our design must include a skin material that has the same qualities that actual human skin does, such as having a hardness level, which we found to range from zero to 20 short eight. Another requirement for the design was to have the easily removable and replaceable skin and veins to allow for easy maintenance of the arm. And for the skin, we wanted to develop a simple mold design to enable the nursing department to manufacture their own skin sheets in-house rather than having to go off and buy an entirely new skin sleeve, which we found to be pretty costly. So in turn, it would save them quite a bit of money. And of course, we also wanted to include the blood pressure system so the nursing students could simulate realistic blood pressure within the dummy arm. So moving on to the next slide. Here we have our team organization. Our team consists of our advisor, Matthias Brew. We have our liaison, Dr. Williams, who is from the nursing department at Cal State LA. Our team lead, Victor Gomez, who was also in charge of the blood pressure system, the manufacturing and design of the blood pressure system. Minerva and I were in charge of material selection and manufacturing, where Minerva was focusing on the, the skin and I was focusing, focusing on the veins. I also worked on 3D reconstruction of the arm. Faustino was in charge of the vein routing and arm modifications and Moaz was in charge of data acquisition and analysis for this project. So even though we all had our respective areas to work on, we all worked cohesively as a team and due to the pandemic, we became even more effective with our communication and more proactive in the distribution of work in order to deliver a substantive project, a substantive solution for this project by the end of the semester. So now I'm going to hand over the presentation to my teammate, Moaz. Thank you. So to continue with the presentation, we'd like to go over the work breakdown structure, the product design for the skin sleeve, as well as the testing and some of those results. Now, uh, on the left side, we can see that, uh, we can see the individual tasks 
that were assigned to each person as previously mentioned by Susanna. And if you look at the fall semester column, that was primarily focused on the research and design aspect of this project. So what kind of material for the skin and veins, how to make it more realistic, uh, what type of pressure for the blood pressure system, et cetera. Now, once uh, that was all compiled, we actually managed to create some concept designs and we narrowed it down to one. The planning from the fall semester were to be executed in the spring semester. As you can see in the uh, spring column, uh, we actually planned to have the practice arm fully assembled. We had all the parts coming in together. And unfortunately, due to the pandemic, some of our initial plans had to be changed. Despite this change, we actually managed to come out with a working blood pressure system, a skin sleeve, developed vein routing, and we even got some testing results done. All in all, I would say that it's a successful outcome considering our circumstances. And now I'd like to pass on the presentation to Minerva and I'll be back in a second. Thank you, Moss. And for the product design, the skin specifically, we chose EcoFlex as the material to be used. And this was for its short A harness, which falls within the range of normal human skin. And the vein material was kept as the current one that the nursing department is using, which is natural rubber latex. For the modifications of the arms, we accomplished a rolling vein feature by widening the canals of the current dummy arm. And the blood pressure system is a simple design which is powered by an electric pump. For the testing, we use a durometer which measures Shorey harness. Next slide, please. And going a little bit more in depth for the material for the skin, it was chosen also for its ability to be molded and demolded without a, the use of a vacuum, which avoids air pockets on the final material. And its ability for it to add pigments to create the realism of skin color. Next slide, please. For the skin sheet design, as you can see on figure number five, it's the cat design. It's a two-piece simple mold, which also avoids air pockets to form on the final design of the um, skin sleeve. And this delivered a universal skin sheet that can be easily removed and replaced by the nursing department, which in turn provides a more cost-effective option for them. And now my teammate Moaz will take over the presentation. Thank you. So just as a reminder, one of our main objectives was to make the skin sleeve more mechanically relevant to human skin, which is why we use the Shore A durometer. Now the Shore A durometer actually measures the hardness of soft materials like gum or shoe insoles and more aptly human skin. So for the skin sleeves, we made samples of the Ecoflex for testing with different ratios of the mixture. In our first test, we collected data for each of those samples. Uh, this included the old skin sleeve as well, which was actually in the range of 47 to 52 short A. And if you look at figure eight, that's actually the handheld uh, short durometer, which is measuring the hardness of that uh, skin sample, which is placed on top of a dummy arm. And just as a reminder, human skin range is about zero to 20 short A, whereas our samples range in between 10 to 17 short A. Next, we actually had to figure out whether these methods were appropriate. So we measured the hardness on a table versus the norm. And we found out that when measuring the hardness, we had to be consistent with the underlying surface so we could get more accurate values. And for the validation of this data, we're supposed to have another testing done between the Ecoflex uh, skin sleeve and a human arm. 
And we were also going to validate with the nursing department to see if it matches up to par with their expectation of a dummy arm. Suffice to say, these plans must be carried on by the next team in order to gain a deeper understanding of the dummy arm. And now I'd like to pass on the presentation to Faustino, who's going to be talking about the vein. Hello, so I'm going to be presenting on the product design on the vein, more exact, the vein placement. Next slide. So before going over the product design, I'm going to talk a little bit about the anatomy. Primarily the veins being used, which is the cephalic, the basilic, and the media cubic. And as we can see, these veins are connected and branching off each other, and this is what we're trying to replicate. And as you can see in figure 10, you can see that the solution is more internal, which makes it difficult to remove those veins. And also that the veins are more parallel to each other, which isn't the branching or the connecting off each other, which was one of the solutions we were trying to fix. Next slide, please. So as you can see in figure 12, this is our solution, which aims to fix these problems previously mentioned. And in our solution, it's designed with an external vein route, which makes it more easily maintenance and replaceable compared to the old dummy arm. And also with um, a silicone band sleeve in order to keep the veins, which are external, from falling off while applying the skin sheet. But another design that we included was the rolling veins, which rolling veins is when a vein, when a nurse hits the vein wrong and misses the center line, which causes the, rain, the veins to roll side to side. And which, what we did to achieve this was by widening the angle in the canal, which allows that little wiggle room to allow that vein to fold side to side, which would allow us to do vein rolling. Next slide. Now we're going to hand the presentation to Victor Gomez. Thank you, Faustino. Um, we'll go ahead and hop into the, the next slide real quick. Right here we have a blood pressure system schematic. Uh, right here is the expanded layout and this is basically to help us understand how the system would work. Uh, right here we have a fluid container that is um, driven by an electric pump and the fluid would go through these three inlet valves that would go through the three main veins being used in the dummy arm. Now, after they return through the outlet valves, it actually passes a pressure gauge. This pressure gauge is me measured in millimeters HG, which is the familiar units of pressure that the nursing department uses. And then um, that would basically return back into the fluid container, allowing everything to be pretty much reusable and easy to operate. And the next slide will go more into depth about the actual design we came up with. Next slide, please. Right here, we have our CAD design in figure 13. Um, the goal was to make a blood pressure system unit that was compact and small enough to carry around with the rest of the system being used. Uh, so what we did is we pretty much have everything all inclusive. So figure 14 and 15, you could see that we have a very visible pressure gauge, easily accessible valves and hoses for maintenance, as well as a very simple to use push button that would activate the, the electric pump. Uh, after testing this, we were able to hold a range of pressure anywhere from 80 to 140 millimeters HG, which is perfect because 140 millimeters HG just so happens to be the average range for people with high blood pressure, which in terms allows the nursing department or whoever's the technician to set these uh, preset um, values for different ranges of, um, for example, patients that the students will be working with in real life. So it allows the students to be a little bit more immersed into this uh, learning experience. And we thought just having that adjustability would work really well. And then uh, just briefly, we're gonna have uh, my teammate Susana take over again. Thank you, Victor. So initially we wanted to optimize the existing arm by making some modifications to it, but we wanted to go even further and 3D reconstruct an entirely new arm by using a photogrammetry software, which in our case, we were using MeshLab and MeshRoom. But due to the unforeseen circumstances caused by the pandemic, even though we had all the necessary tools, we just couldn't follow through with this. 
So moving on to the next slide. Here you could somewhat visualize what our final product would have been without the interruption of the COVID. We would have 3D printed an entirely new arm. We would have manufactured our own skin sheets the arm would have a more realistic vein routing system with the vein rolling feature. And it would also include a blood pressure system, which would result in an entirely new assembled dummy arm. So now Victor is going to finish off the presentation for us. All right, right here we have our cost analysis slide. We decided to split it up to four major segments. We have uh, skin material, the vein design, the blood pressure system, and the maintenance. Now, briefly, I want to go over the first three. Uh, the skin material that we're using is the EcoFlex, and compared to the current skin sleeve replacement, we're already saving about $10 there, and that's for multiple sheets compared to one. And in terms of vein design, we're using the same material, but due to our design and the structure we came up with, the maintenance is a lot easier to focus on in terms of replacing the veins. The blood pressure system itself is only a $25 one-time cost to assemble it, and then maintenance is just as cheap because the veins are only about four bucks. Um, now here's where I wanna highlight our solution versus the current solution. Now our solution comes out to a total of $78 versus the current solution at 350. Now what our solution has to offer is all the veins and more features with, um, with four skin sheets opposed to the one that you would buy for 70 bucks and then we wouldn't have to buy a whole new system every single time as the nursing department is currently doing. You'd simply just replace what needs to be replaced. And due to our design, we have something that is a lot more easy to maintain, operate, and just much more affordable in the long run. Uh, with that being said, we're going to go on to the next slide where I want to highlight some of our major um, accomplishments. In terms of skin design, we were able to produce a skin sheet that was not just universal in, in fit, we actually met all our desired um, shore A hardness ranges, which makes it you know, more realistic in terms of mimicking human um, skin characteristics. It's also easily to fasten and maintain on the current dummy arm that we're using. Uh, the vein design worked really well. We actually have an external layout opposed to the internal layout, which makes maintaining it very easy. Um, adding the realistic rolling vein features um, just increases the learning experience for the nursing students that much more in addition to having the blood pressure system that um, is easy to operate and can add to that learning experience. Uh, we also have uh, da or data that can you know, support our findings for the skin sheets. A um, few things that are on here that I want to mention, uh, as previously stated, due to the COVID-19 um, pandemic, we were kind of cut short of what we wanted to do. But in that time, we were able to work on other things that we didn't initially plan on since uh, we actually ended up making a lab manual for the nursing department on how to manufacture their own skin sheets long-term, as well as an operating manual for the students to know how to operate the system when it comes to them actually using it. And we feel like with the given circumstances, we're able to produce something that is very, um, something we could be proud of as a team. And I'd like to thank my team for that. And with that being said, uh, I'd like to conclude our presentation. And if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very interesting presentation. I wanna ask the first question, just go back one slide. I saw this picture several times. Do the veins in an actual arm cross over like that? Or is that no. just the way they... So okay. in a realistic, you know, like full-blown realistic scenario, the veins are actually teed off like they're like if they were stitched together, they tee off from each other as one whole unit. However, when we discussed that option with the nursing department, it would be uh, too difficult for them to continue to continuously maintain and manufacture a system like that. There isn't really anything that is currently on the market that already has hoses that are branched off as one unit. We also considered having T-type connectors and Y-type connectors to create this effect, but we run the risk of having the nursing students during practice hitting that hard plastic with the needle. And that kind of takes away from that immersive learning experience. So the way we bypassed that was by creating a layer that would go, one, one would run right, right over the other. So okay. kind of mimicking instead of replicating. Okay, thank you. Max. 
It's a little bit reassuring to know. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Um, yeah, I'll, feel free, the next person to step up and ask a question, just remember to unmute your microphone. Okay, let me ask another then. At the very beginning, you indicated that one of the problems that you had with the current skin type was that the um, once a hole was punctured in it, you could still see the hole and that that would allow subsequent students to have some idea about where to stick a needle. But mm -hmm. as, as I understand your presentation, you're remaining, you're keeping the same skin material. Is that correct? Okay, so the current system is just a regular base silicone. The manufacturer doesn't have specifications on what the ratio of what the actual specs are on it. Um, with the material that they were using, that um, Shore A hardness was a lot stiffer. And then in terms of having it punctured, we had um, actually incorporated a, what's called a power mesh sheet into our design. So what happens is when someone punctures our skin sheet, that sheet underneath that was molded within the, the silicone creates tension. So that tension closes the hole just a little bit more. It doesn't completely make it invisible, but it is visibly better than the current system that is out there. And another way we were able to get past that was by making the sheets, you know, more affordable and, you know, easy to, re easy to replace. It's just that much easier for the nursing department just to be like, okay, this one's done. Let's replace it and it's not gonna cost us a fortune. Okay. So I had a question, Mike. So, um, so there's a lot of really cool stuff, nice work team. Um, I'm, I might've missed it at the end there. So is there kind of like a full arm that your team has made and has been, uh, that you've been testing to puncture? I'm kind of curious, like where's the, you know, you know is there an arm basically ready to hand off to the nurses at this point, or are we still going to have to do some final puncturing and testing? So, it off? our overall was to have a fully assembled unit. We do have each individual component. Like, we have the skin sheet, we have the arm that's already um, routed, we have the blood pressure system that we have tested, and it does work. It's just, um, we, you know, we wanted to get it tested late March by the nursing department to have them see if it's a system that they can actually operate with themselves and it's something they're happy with. But like we already said, due to the pandemic and the whole stay at home order, we weren't able to meet up with them like we wanted to. But to answer your question, from what we were able to gather from this semester, I believe that if we could assemble it, you know, all together as one unit, you know, hook up all the veins and hoses that we need to, I think it would be ready to go we would definitely have to have the nursing department practice puncturing on it because that would give us more feedback in terms of does that feel as realistic as it could be? Because when we're making the skin sheet, we could actually make various uh, ranges of shore hardness depending on the ratio that we mix it at. And depending on that feedback we could have gotten from the nursing department, that would have gave us kind of a general idea of like, all right, let's make it a little bit softer. Let's make it a little bit stiffer. And then that goes hand in hand with everything else in terms of the blood pressure and the veins as well. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, totally understandable. You guys, it, that you, you know, you I got all the systems independently done, but there wasn't as much of an opportunity this semester to bring it all together. But all right, this sounds cool. We'll have to, we'll have to bug uh, Dr. Brio a little bit more about uh, how many, is there some students in his lab ready to walk over to the nursing department, hopefully at the end of summer. All right, thanks team. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if not, um, I'd like to thank the team for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, congratulations. Uh, for the audience, please remember to fill out the evaluation form. Um, the link has been posted on Zoom. I will do that again right now. And um, if, our, I guess our next presentation is gonna be an, um, 
at four o'clock sharp. So we've got about about 10 minutes or so um, to take a short break. Um, but, but don't go anywhere. We've still got three more presentations this afternoon um, that uh, I'm sure are gonna be very interesting to see. Thank you. Okay, we'll start up again in about one minute. Okay, now that T Fox has arrived, we can get started. Um, everybody, welcome to Expo 2020, our first virtual expo. Um, we've got three more presentations this afternoon in this electrical engineering and mechanical engineering section. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the format. Uh, we The papers are on on 40 minute centers, um, but we expect the presentations to last about 20 minutes. So there should be ample time after the presentation uh, for our questions and answers. Okay. We do seek your feedback. And so there is a Qualtrics survey to fill out. Um, I've posted it in the chat room. Um, so you can find the link there if you haven't, if you don't remember where the link is before. You should have received the link at the same time you received the invitation to come to the, uh, the, or the symposium. Okay. Um, so I guess then is the entire delivery robot team here? Nobody's speaking up. Yes, yes we are. Okay, thank you. I all was right. just checking that we were all here. Okay. Yes. Very good then. So let me introduce the delivery robot team. This is a project sponsored by the Department of Electrical Engineering um, um, here on campus. So without further delay, welcome. Um, thank you, Mike. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome one and all. I am Alexander Pedroza and I'd like to welcome you to our delivery robot project presentation. Our devoted team of six has worked diligently to present to you today our findings in constructing Calcet LA's first iteration of a delivery robot. Um, now I will give you an overview of today's presentation where we will begin by giving a background of the project and the path that we decided to take, transforming a manually maneuvering robot and building up its capabilities to become fully autonomous then giving you an insight on some of the decision-making that went into choosing some of the components, starting with the software and then finishing off with the hardware design. Lastly, you will hear a bit of the robot's functionalities achieved by our software team, before once again providing an executive summary of our team's accomplishments. So let's begin. We all know how easy it is to purchase things online nowadays. Products have become readily available to satisfy any, any customer's needs. However, all of these services still require a human to perform the task and leave a package at your door. 
Our project seeks to remove the need for humans and instead utilize modern technologies to deliver your package straight to you. With ROS or Robot Operating System offering such powerful developer tools, we hope to utilize its functionalities for writing our robot software. It offers a set of libraries and tools that can help build any robotic application. With the aid of a Raspberry Pi, we can allow ROS to compute at lightning speeds. From our goal of creating a fully autonomous delivery robot, we sought to define some of the key aspects to take a planned approach. Here, we broke down our project to its core components. First, for our project, we sought to create a robot requiring minimal to no human interaction. With the way the coronavirus has impacted all of our lives, it's suddenly become a more desirable objective. Our focus should also encompass how the package is carried and removed, both by the operator and recipient. It's important to us that the robot remain along the shortest path as this results in a timely arrival at our destination. We must also include an aspect of obstacle avoidance as this is a fundamental part of developing a robot that will be truly autonomous, able to run in any environment. Lastly, it will also be important for us to optimize our design while keeping the risks in mind, seeking to maximize the weight of the package without hindering our rover's speed and performance. And although we want our rover to arrive at its destination in a timely manner, we also had to be sure that it would travel at a safe speed, being able to avoid obstacles without being a danger to society. So without repeating myself, uh, you can see that our requirements are rooted from our objectives, seeking to more clearly define what we should expect from this project, giving more concrete ideas on how to approach each objective, starting with the manual design and transforming it with added on autonomous capabilities. Um, from our chassis specs, we were able to conclude that the rover should be able to carry 15 pounds and choosing a required speed that was based on the average human walking speed, three miles per hour. Uh, our members' knowledges range over an array of disciplines, and from this, we sought to divide members accordingly. As you may have already assumed, I am the team lead, and I oversee the two subdivisions consisting of the software and hardware team each member having a more elaborate set of tasks and focus in the project. By dividing the team into these sub, two subcategories, we were able to divide the work evenly amongst all members. Uh, now I'll pass it over to Misao. Thank you, Alex. Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Misael Duran. I am part of the software team. Today I, will be this, today I will be discussing our plans for manual control to autonomous control because this is a first year project allow us in the air for design, research, and testing. Next slide, please. We believe achieving manual control is an important early step in order to make autonomous control easier later on. Some key elements for manual control is to have a good base structure that will involve a Raspberry Pi, a chassis that was donated to us by our advisor Mozang, and other electrical components. The Raspberry Pi is a microcontroller. You can think of it like a brain. It will receive data, control the motor drivers, the ultrasonic sensor, and other components. Manual control is good for when we need to override autonomous control. A good example is when it is running along a, on a sidewalk. It could be dangerous for it to fall off onto the street as there are vehicles, and it could also cause damage to the rover itself. Manual control is also great for us for doing initial testing. We could find weight and speed capacities Furthermore, we could, also see our, we could also see ourselves because we did the testing with our own eyes of any flaws to fix and also we could find possible improvements. Our manual testing was done with a keyboard and a joystick that controlled its direction. For autonomous control, this would be a huge step. However, this will really help us. Some, some of the implementations that help autonomous control are GPS, IMU, and SLAM. GPS is a global positioning system. IMU is the inertial measurement unit and SLAM is a simultaneous localization and mapping. However, these implementations were a little too much for us to handle with the time given and the, and the presence of COVID-19. Next slide, please. So as mentioned earlier, here I will describe our operational workflow diagram. The Raspberry Pi, once again, is like the control, a microcontroller that will give us a lot of possibilities for achieving both manual and autonomous control. On the left, we have manual con operation that will be controlled by a radio, receiver, a radio controller. 
for our navigation and the maneuvering of the robot, we had two motor drivers and four motors. Each motor driver would control two motors respectively. We had an ultrasonic sensor that would read the distance of obstacles. For our visualization, as mentioned earlier, we ran the test ourselves and we used our own eyes to fix any flaws. On the right side, we have autonomous operation. Autonomous operation would ultimately depend on ROS. For our navigation, it would be the same with two motor drivers and four motors. For visualization, we would hope to implement uh, comp uh, computer visualization and a camera. For our localization, we would use GPS, IMU, and SLAM once again. GPS is a global positioning system, which would give us its location in real time. IMU is an inertial measurement unit, which would give us statistics about its speed, balance, etc. Uh, SLAM would be the most important aspect because this is a program that will update an environment based on the data and obstacles that it has received on. It will ignore obstacles, familiarize itself with the environment, and this will ultimately help find the shortest route to its destination. Next slide, please. Now I will hand it off to David, my teammate, who will continue. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Rivera and I'm part of the software team. Today I will be talking about the electrical component trait studies. Next slide, please. This project required us to use a microcontroller. There are various options that we could have chosen from, such as the Arduino, PSOC, and TM4C board, to name a few. Each board had their pros and cons, such as the Arduino having the smallest size, but low clock speed, and the PSOC having low cost, but more difficult to integrate ROS. We ultimately decided to go with the Raspberry Pi because it had the most online resources to integrate ROS because its clock, its clock speed was the highest and its overall size was a plus. Next slide, please. The motors powering the wheels need to have a motor driver to help handle the high current and voltage to move the robot effectively. During our initial testing, we used a variety of motor drivers on the motors. This helped to see what each motor driver was missing and what we needed for the robot to work effectively. We chose to go with the L298N motor driver because of the higher input voltage. It can power two motors per motor driver and it's low cost. Next slide, please. To power the motors, we need batteries. Initially, we were donated a battery from Advisor that was great for testing a few motors at a time. In order for the robot to be able to move all four wheels, we had to get more batteries. We needed batteries with at least 12 volts and a good amount of milliamps. Cost was another thing we had to consider due to our limited budget. We decided to go with the LiPo Forest batteries because they have 14.8 volts, 3200 milliamps, and for the price, it comes with two batteries. Next slide, please. Next, I will pass it on to Sam. Hi, my name is Sam and I'm part of the hardware team. I'll be talking about the container and chassis design. Next slide, please. First, I will discuss our test case. We used the L298N motor driver to run a speed and weight test, producing better results compared to other motor drivers. We initially started with 4.5 kilograms of weight and went up increments of 1 to 2 kilograms. At 4.5 kilograms, the robot was able to move at a speed of 1.4 meters per second. And at 8.5 kilograms, the robot was able to move at a speed of 0 0.6 meters per second. Our limit was set at 9 kilograms where the motors would stall. Since the robot weighs 6.8 kilograms, that leaves us with no more than 1.7 kilograms left to carry. Using the L298N motor driver, we were able to achieve these results. On the other hand, if we were to use more suitable drivers, we may be able to achieve higher speed and carry more weight. Next slide, please. Next, I'll be talking about the initial designs. The picture on the left shows one of our first models. As you can see, mounted on the front panel is an ultra sensor and a camera. We plan to use this setup for an autonomous design with the addition of three ultra sensors, one on each face. The picture on the right shows most of the electrical components required for this project. These initial designs were made out of cardboard because those are, these are, uh, they are inexpensive and easy to work with. 
Next slide, please. This slide shows the draft of the container. Here we have two separate components, the storage area for delivery and the electrical components. As shown with the yellow arrow, the electrical component will be below the storage area. And in order to access it, we would simply remove the top part that is attached with brackets. The purpose of this design was to make the electrical component more accessible. However, we came to a conclusion that this would require more parts leading to more weight and require more effort. Next slide, please. So for our final design, we decided to make one container with both a storage area and an electrical component area. In place would be a removable board separating the storage area and the electrical components. Currently, the container is made out of plywood and attached together using brackets. The reason we chose plywood was because it was cheap and easily accessible. The container is attached to the chassis using nails and the volume of the storage area is about 0.015 cubic meters. Presently, the robot is manually driven, but we intend to make it autonomous, allowing customers to retrieve their package without a handle. For this, the hatch would need to prop open on its own. The yellow arrow points to an opening mechanism where it will push the hatch open. Next slide, please. Here we show the opening mechanism for autonomous use. As shown in the video provided, the bracket, uh, the shaft rotates the bracket. Uh, the shaft is rotated, uh, rotating, moving the bracket up and around. With the use of a stepper motor, the bar will only rotate to a certain degree just enough to provide space to gain access to storage area. In theory, for the customers to retrieve their packages, they would need to input a code provided via text. Inputting the correct code on a three by three number pad would unlock the hatch. And to prevent theft, the hatch would be aligned with the walls of the container, making it difficult to open. Next slide, please. Next, I'll be handing it off to Hong. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jun Hong Tang. I'm going to talk about the uh, robot control functions. Next slide, please. So here is a manual obstacle avoidance. So it is like the toy car we play when we were kids. Uh, we are using the controller to control robot in order to not hit uh, any obstacle on the way. So we are pressing the button on the controller to give the direction. And the transmitter is going to send the direction information into the receiver. And after the embedded process, uh, the DC motor will get a signal to tell uh, what the motor should do. Uh, next slide, please. So here is the autonomous uh, obstacle avoidance. Uh, in this case, we are using the sensor and Raspberry Pi instead of human interaction. So in the manual um, obstacle avoidance, we are using our eyes to see the obstacle and use the controller to control the robot to uh, avoid the obstacle. The sensor on, the, on this robot is like our eyes that can detect the distance uh, from the robot to the obstacle and send the information to the Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pi is going to tell what the motor should do um, according to what distance we have. Um, Jessica is going to talk uh, talk about how the information got compared inside of Raspberry Pi later on. Um, next slide, please. Um, here are the electrical components we are using for autonomous feature. Uh, we are connecting the laptop to Raspberry Pi by Wi-Fi router. So we can edit it, the code uh, on the laptop and then upload it to the Raspberry Pi. So we don't have to write a code on the Raspberry Pi directly. We are using the laptop as initial to start the autonomous programs. Next slide, please. Now Jessica is going to talk about uh, how the robot does uh, obstacle avoidance uh, and the uh, summaries. Hi, my name is Jessica and I'm part of the software team. As previously mentioned, we have designed and implemented an auton autonomous obstacle avoidance algorithm. In order for us to design this, we need to know three key things. The size of the object we want our robot to detect, 
the speed of the robot, and the reaction time of the robot. The reaction time of the robot is a crucial piece of information we need to know as this, as this will determine whether the robot will be able to avoid the object or crash into it. The, avoid the avoidance algorithm consists of two conditional statements, which are highlighted in yellow in the float diagram. The algorithm begins with the ultrasonic sensor transmitting signals. It then goes into the first condi conditional statement. If an object is detected within 200 centimeters from the delivery robot, the avoidance detection algorithm will be triggered and the robot will be able to avoid the object. Then it loops back at the beginning and so forth. But if an object isn't detected, then it would go into the second conditional statement. In the second conditional statement, we check to see whether or not the delivery robot has reached its final destination. If the robot has reached its final destination, then the algorithm completes. Else, it loops back to the beginning and continues the flow of the, of the algorithm. Next slide, please. Furthermore, the avoidance algorithm uses a ROS publish, publisher node and a ROS subscriber node to bridge the communication between the ultrasonic sensor and the motor drivers. The publisher node provides the distance of the object that is being detected. The distance is then sent over to the subscriber node. The subscriber node then stores the distance and checks to see whether an object has been detected within 200 centimeters from the delivery robot. If this conditional statement is true, then it will send over a signal to the motor drivers to let the delivery robot know what to do in order to avoid the object. Next slide, please. Lastly, I will be providing a brief summary of how the project went overall. Next slide, please. Uh, here is the budget and the materials and components that we use. It costs about $400 or so. Luckily, our advisor Mo Zhang was able to provide us with a lot of the components which helped us stay relatively close within budget. Next slide, please. Overall, throughout this past year, the team was able to complete various tasks. The tasks we were able to fully complete were the manual maneuvering of the delivery robot, the container design, and the object detection. Unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, we were unable to fully complete the fabrication of the container, the opening mechanism, and the obstacle avoidance algorithm. As for future iterations of this project, the construction of the chassis will need to be fabricated and the implementation of the GPS and SLAM features will be necessary for the delivery robot to fully become autonomous. Next slide, please. Lastly, we would like to take the time to thank our advisor Mo Zhang for all the feedback, resources, and time he dedicated to the team, as well as Dr. Liu, the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Thank you. Next slide, please. And questions. Okay, thank you. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, all you need to do is unmute your microphone. And who would like to go first? Hi, Mike. I have some questions. Okay. Uh, one of you, one of you mentioned about stepper motor, and then the next person uh, says. Uh, this motor. So, what's what's the type of motor you guys are sele selected? Um, the stepper motor was supposed to be for this uh, video. Sorry for not playing it during the presentation. Um, and we wanted, uh, we were hoping the little knob that you see on the left okay, image, okay. the shaft, would All be right. containing the stepper motor that would be rotating the bracket, which okay. would then open the lid for the container okay. autonomously. Yeah. All right, so basically the motor driver is a uh, BLDC motor? The motor, yes, DC motors powering DC, the uh, wheels. Yeah, BLDC, BLDC, brushless. Okay. And also, you guys have considered the kind of environmental condition like a heavy rain or wind or that kind of condition? Mm, considering that we're using the um, plywood, uh, I would say that our design does not consider environmental conditions. Okay. Uh, another question uh, I have is, uh, what's the range of uh, uh, traveling for this motor? Um, we intended our uh, design to be used uh, exclusively for Cal State LA campus. Oh, inside the campus? Yes. Okay, so road condition should be excellent. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? <laughs> if 
Going once, going twice. Okay, I have a question. Okay. So can the ultrasonic sensor detect like uh, debris on the floor because it might affect like the travel? Uh, you're asking if it can detect debris? Yeah, on the floor because some, sometimes the robot might actually try to run over it and might tip over. Yeah, I know. At the moment, we only um, chose that size to be able to detect. I feel like it, it was a 9 by 9 by 28, I believe. I don't know how big debris you're referring to as well. Like perhaps maybe like a pebble on the ground. So oh, okay. The wheels might get caught on the pebble and cannot move. Yeah, I, we didn't test that because we didn't have time. Like to test it, you know, with a pebble, unfortunately. How big a obstacle did you test, or what range of size of obstacles did you test with? Uh, it was a nine by nine by twenty eight. It's basically kind of like um, I don't know if you've seen like a water flask, kind of like that size. Yeah, it's in one of the slides. Okay. And remind me at what. Distance, can you detect that? Uh, we did it at 200 centimeters. The ultrasonic sensor can detect up to like four meters, but we didn't choose that because we just didn't want it to be so sensitive to, you know, we don't want it to re um, react that quickly. Just in case if, you know, the object, they moved, etc. because then it would take us like through a longer path, etc. Okay. So I have another question. So you mentioned uh, the robot is probably autonomous. Uh, is it fully autonomous? Because, or it's like partially? It's uh, partially. So okay. So it comes, so a person has to accompany the robot in that case. Uh, at the moment, well, if it's the man like the manual, I don't say fully just because it's not to where we would want it to be. Currently, you know, like we send over um, the code to the Raspberry Pi and then it does its thing. So we don't like necessarily have to be like with it, if that makes sense. Um, and our intent for the project was to, was to start with like a manual design and then build up the autonomous features. So although we weren't able to uh, complete like a fully autonomous design, um, I mean, we did consider a lot of factors um, that would uh, be implemented into the final uh, and future designs uh, and being that we're the first um, iteration of this project uh, we were only able to achieve so much i get you uh from experience like first year role sub was like pretty rough mm. uh, and like yeah after years like we do build on upon knowledge and we got to like a certain point where we can almost be fully autonomous yeah Sorry, you have really bad static. <laughs> I was like, it, it kind of hurts my ear. Um, did you have any other questions or like? I have a question about, so um, someone who frequently comes home to find my package isn't actually on my doorstep. Um, did you guys have some considerations about, you know, a lot of time this is probably sensitive information that's getting delivered or paychecks and stuff. You know, you think about stopping someone, finding a way to somehow keep someone from picking it up and putting it in the back of their car or just popping it open real, real quick and taking what's, out, taking what's out of it. Um, I think that's why um, we gave ourselves a 30% completion on this opening mechanism um, because, and, and also the autonomous delivery system um, because we weren't able to fully um, uh, include a locking part to the mechanism. As you can tell right now, it only opens um, with no lock uh, currently. Um, we did have a few considerations, but um, being that the design is so small, uh, able to carry such little weight, uh, we weren't able to really implement that into our current design. So for future um, iterations of the project, we, we would hope that um, they'd be able to consider some of those aspects 
Um, we did have that in mind, but we weren't able to really address any of those issues. All right, thanks, John. That was cool to see you were thinking about it, but uh, next next phases. Very cool. Yeah. We were also thinking of implementing like a, you know, you put in your code so you can get the package. Like that was one thing we were thinking about too. That would consider someone to be there, you know, for their package, et cetera. But that's a more secure way to make sure that nobody takes your package. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Yeah, I do have one question regarding the uh, avoidance. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, what I say is you choose to have, a, again, 200 centimeter away as a object detection the criteria. I was wondering if somebody walking forward to the, you know, that moving vehicle, is that good enough distance to maneuvering their vehicle to avoid that, you know, kind of crush. I mean, where does that 200 centimeter come from and that criteria? Yes. Because everybody's walking around in campus, right? And that vehicle size is very small. Somebody might not have to see it. Yes, correct. So currently the way it works right now, as I mentioned, it's not fully completed. And it's not how we would want it to work. Um, currently it only like we chose that because we thought that like 1.5 seconds in translation would be enough reaction time. Like obviously we would want it to do like a better job, you know, at making sure if it detects an object and it's moving, like what would it do? But the current project at the moment, like we weren't able to test the other factors. So unfortunately right now it's not able to do that. Like it was more like of a test, like a testing phase. We begin test, we began testing, but then with the whole lockdown, we were unable to do it. Unfortunately. What is the reason that you choose to use that ultrasound sensor to detect that you know, object? Well, we mainly chose it just like, what was the thing? Well, it was compatible with Ross and we were looking into other uh, ultrasonic sensors, but they, I mean, sorry, old, other type of sensors, but they were a little bit more expensive as well. And that's kind of like what we had at the moment. Which was price wise. Excuse me? It was a, like a cost wise decision. It, it some, uh, yeah, part of it. Okay. Like it, yeah. I understand like everybody like to have this autonomous, you know, function in their system. But the mm -hmm. thing is autonomous is a very Powerful, made, made, I mean, very convenient, but it's very dangerous in yeah, terms definitely. of the safety. Yeah, so sure. saving a couple dollars or you know, ten dollars, twenty dollars, they might not be very economical in terms of you know, you need to pay insurance, you know, all those things when you with somebody else. So you might consider those future tests when you suggest. I mean, this pandemic area will cause a lot of you know, incomplete project. That I understand that, but what I suggest you guys to provide some kind of future task at the end of the report, what can it be done, you know, in, when it's, you know, over, that somebody is gonna take over your project. I really like this particular project, mm -hmm. because this is very useful for the campus, if it can be well developed. So, and a lot of students can be benefit out of this project. So I want this project to be continued, you know, throughout the whole, many years coming. So whole thing is about, you know, documentation. If you can, I see a lot of documentation is not very well prepared for the senior design, but I really strongly suggest you to prepare some kind of, you know, good documentation. So somebody else comes in, they don't have to start all over again. That's what I suggest for this particular project. Okay. That's definitely. Thank you for that feedback. And as I mentioned, yeah, we do have a lot of ideas of how we would like to see this project go in the future. And definitely for, you know, using a better sensor, using a better like algorithm for this is definitely on, you know, on our mind. Thank you. Good Thank work. You. Yeah, some very useful advice. Thank you, Choi. Thank you. Yeah, that's actually good advice. Um, we do, uh, 
we do plan to have like future iterations and with some of our research we plan to leave some sort of like designs and like suggestions that's great okay other questions yes uh how would the imu work in slam like is it supposed to track where the robots has been or um so so about imu um we have not touched upon that so oh, that would yeah that would require a sensor uh which would be sort of like a different topic we need to touch on okay you guys haven't played yet no sorry no. about that yeah that's okay thank you uh question hello can you hear me go ahead Hi, I have a question about that's kind of in line with the safety question. So um, I noticed that if you go back to the slide on your computing architecture, um, you all chose the Raspberry Pi, um, which, you know, in ROS, it runs Linux, but um, usually this tends to, you know, it, it has a potential to crash because it's actually running a non real time operating system. So I was wondering what could you do to improve the computer architecture, like computing architecture of your general system so that there are fail safes, for instance, if you know a sensor goes haywire or the system crashes, the software crashes. Um, I think that was one of the design intents um, from starting with manual control. Um, as explained, like in one of the later slides, you know, um, we visually were able to control it with the RC controller. Um, that was so that we were, and, and it had a camera as well. That was so that we can intervene um, in any instance that the uh, autonomous uh, design doesn't um, work. We would be able to manually con control and maneuver um, the robot through the environment. That's so the I current design. I, I wouldn't know about future. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, so my my question is, what if the uh, manual software crashes? So my my point here is that because you are running a, a non non real time operating system. Uh, you know, you're not handling things with interrupts per se, so you have a potential for really weird problems with your software. So, what are what are some kind of mechanisms that you think you could add on in order to prevent software crashes from affecting the performance of your robot, or for for putting the robot in a dangerous position, or for you know, for instance, if it crashes in the middle of the delivery to stop it from running over a user, for example. Um, I mean, to be honest, I'm going to say we really didn't consider that. I mean, we did, but we don't have anything in place right now. But um, yeah, sorry, I don't know how to further answer your question. I mean, but I totally understand, obviously, because it is a, a danger, you know, if something does crash and then the robot just like goes haywire, that can be really bad. So we would have to, we would have had to implement like a backup plan as to like cutting off power or something, you know, so the robot can just like do like, um, like an exit plan, you know. Great. Yeah, that is something we should definitely document. Yeah. Have a team to work on if, if you don't have any. Okay, we'll definitely, um, on our report, we'll definitely add it and I'll, I can say, I'll take a look at it as well to see, um, to give recommendations for future iterations. Okay. Oh, Kevin, you had a question? Yeah, uh, so speaking from experience, like one sensor isn't enough for autonomy. Uh, so the, my question to them is to, what other sensors besides the IMU do you plan to incorporate for future designs to add more autonomy to the system? We wanted to use a LiDAR. So I think that one is just 
you know, it's better, especially like a 360 LiDAR sensor as well, instead of just like one or like three ultrasonic sensors in total. So that would be initially, that's something we would put on the report, you know, in order for us to like make it work better, like definitely a LiDAR sensor, like sensor was on our mind. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, um, thank you team. It was a very interesting presentation and we need to move on to the next one. Um, thank you very much for being here today. And let me thank the audience for participating and for asking all the questions. Don't forget that there's a Qualtrics survey for everybody to fill out to provide some feedback to the teams and to the program. If you, there was a link to the Qualtrics survey in the chat room. If you need another copy, let me know. I'll send you something. Great. Thank you, Mike, for having us. Um, Thank you for I had a question. I had a question though, where would we be able to access the recording for this presentation? Everybody's asking the same question. Uh, okay, I'm working sorry. on it this week. Yeah. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Who's that? Okay, so the next thing will start in just a couple of minutes. This is a rocket aerodynamics team. Um, Is Livio and the rest of the team in, in the room? Oh, here Livio's about ready to be admitted. I need to have somebody in the uh, rocket aerodynamics team take over control of the screen. Yes, um, I'm about to share my screen. Okay, thank you. started in just a second. No worries. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. This is, uh, welcome to Expo 2020, our first virtual expo. We've got two presentations left in this session this afternoon. Um, the first one is on rocket aerodynamics. It's a, a project associated with the Cal State L LA Rocket Club. Um, we expect the presentation to last about 20 minutes. After that, there'll be ample time for questions and answers. Um, and then don't forget to take a, uh, a complete a, a survey at the end uh, as we seek to get your opinions to share with the students and to improve the program. Uh, without then any further delay, let me introduce the Rocket Aerodynamic and Stability Team. You guys ready to go? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to our uh, faculty advisor, Dr. Arshlan, and our sponsor, the Cal State LA Rocketry, uh, Eagle Rocketry Club. Our group members are Dennis Villanueva, Jorge Hernandez, Livio Campanotto, Lionel Lado, and Christopher Merlos. First off with the introduction will be Lionel Lado. So thank you for coming to our presentation. Our project is about aer rocketry aerodynamic instability. So a little background about what that is. We will, we will define some terms for you guys. What is aerodynamic? Aerodynamic is an applied science that focuses on fluid flow and interaction with objects. In our project, we use computational fluid dynamics 
known as CFD. What is CFD? CFD is an applied mathematic fluid mechanic and computational method used to demonstrate fluid flow interaction with objects. One of the criteria, criteria of the project was stability, which is the tendency for the rocket to return to its intended flight path after a disturbance. During our presentation, you also hear some, you, you will hear some terms that like drag force or drag coefficient. What is drag force? Drag force is a resistant force caused by motion of a body through, through a fluid. You can see in the picture here, like someone trying to stop the rocket to go through. That's his drag force. And this is, uh, is quantified by the drag coefficient, which is a measurement of how the drag force impacts a fluid ability to efficiently travel through wind resistance. Next is our objective. On the objective, there is two objectives basically in this uh, project. The sponsor has the objective. What is the uh, Eagle Rocketry Club? It's a campus organization composed of engineering students with the intent to design, manufacture, and compete in the Spaceport America Cup, which is an international competition. Now we were given the design of a aerodynamic and stable rocket. And we focus this on three points. The design that will have a low drag, a design that will maintain a stability throughout the fly. And at the end, the, the end goal will be to reach an altitude of 30,000 feet. Next will be the system overview that Jorge Hernandez will present to you. Good afternoon. I'll begin the system overview by covering the design requirements. Requirement number one is a, function, is a functional requirement and consists of maintaining low drag. Our vehicle achieved a max drag coefficient of 0 0.105, which fulfills this aerodynamics criteria. The second requirement is for the vehicle to maintain stable throughout its trajectory. The team confirms stability criteria in, uh, analytically. The final requirement is for the vehicle to reach an altitude of 30,000 feet. Unfortunately, the vehicle only reached 15,328 feet. This requirement was a big struggle because of unknown parameters that were out of the scope of this project. However, to assist in reaching the target height, the team made efforts to, des to design with weight management in mind. This is a complete overview of the finalized vehicle. We work closely with the Eagle Rocketry Club in order to reduce the amount of changes to the vehicle. The finalized vehicle is a combination of the club's design at the start of the spring semester in combination with our final nose and fin designs. With regards to the nose cone section, research was conducted to determine which nose cones perform best in a velocity region of 400 through 1600 miles per hour. Based on research, the team selected the 0 0.5 and 0 0.75 power series cones and the Von Karman nose cone. The 0 0.5 and 0 0.75 numbers for the power series define how blunt the tip is at the front of the nose. As the number increases from zero to one, the nose, tim, the nose tip becomes blunt. All three nose cones were evaluated at a velocity of 456 through 1,523 miles per hour with constant sea level conditions. The main reason for using constant sea level conditions is to evaluate performance with the only differing variable being the geometry. CFD results for coefficient of drag versus velocity show that in the subsonic region, the von Karman maintains low, a low coefficient of drag and passed 
913 miles per hour, the 0 0.75 power series outperforms the Von Karman. Regardless of, of outperforming the Von Karman in the supersonic region, the team feels it, it's important to perform with low drag in the subsonic region because of the drastic changes in drag compared to the changes that take place in others in the supersonic region. So the Von Karman nose is the final choice. The fuselage section did not undergo many modifications. It's a constraint established by the Eagle Rocketry Club. Also, by keeping the same fuselage, we can establish CFD performance data for the fuselage. Fins. A quantity of four fins is used for the design because it's a constant, it's a constraint from the Eagle Rocketry Club. The tapered swept fins have a stretched hexagon shape at the bottom and sweep back approximately 31 degrees. This design was the, was the least, this design has the least surface area compared to the tapered and the trapezoidal NACA 0006 uh, fins. The trapezoid, the trapezoidal and tapered have a NACA 0006 airfoil cross section. This design was selected to see how it performs com compared to the straight edge designs like the tapered swept. Fin performance was evaluated with a nose cone and fuselage in order to observe the interaction between the three different components. CFD results demonstrate that the tapered swift along with the Von Karman nose produced the least drag compared to the other two combinations. In the subsonic region, all three fins produced relatively the same drag. From 837 to 1522 miles per hour, drag differs with the tapered swift contributing the least amount of drag. Since one of the objectives is to maintain low drag, we deem that the tapered swept fins combined with the Von Karman nose to be the over the velocity region of 456 through 1523 miles per hour was the best design. Next up is Rocket Aerodynamics by Dennis Villanueva. Good afternoon, I will go over rocket aerodynamics. The CFD results that will be demonstrated will be valued at about 15 miles, 15, 1500 miles per hour, which is about Mach 2, because at that location, the rocket experience, the, experience the highest drag force. Now here we have this velocity profile of the rocket. As you can see, as you, this allows us to see how the velocity changes throughout the rocket. The areas that we will be looking at is at the tip of the nose cone at the tail end of the rocket. On the left, we have the nose cone section of the rocket with velocity streamlines. At the tip of the nose cone, you can see that the velocity is zero, which means that that point is a stagnation point. As a result, the pressure is the highest at that point. On the right side, we have the back end of the rocket. It's visible in the circle that turbulence occurs at that location. However, this could be avoided by attaching a, a bolt tail at the back of the rocket. At that location as well, there will be some exhaust from burning up of the fuel, so that flow at the location will be different. These pictures only represent the rocket cruising at Mach 2. Here on the left side, we have an isometric view of the rocket showing the pressure distribution. Now focusing on the nose cone on the left, we can see that the velocity, where the velocity was zero at the tip of the nose cone, the pressure was the highest of 19 PSI. Yet that would not affect the performance of the rocket because of the material selection that the nose cone is made out of. Similarly, looking at the fin location, we can see the pressure is distributed uniformly along the fin in the fuselage. However, looking at the circle location, is where the pressure is the highest on the leading edge of the fin. Therefore, we need to make sure that that location is reinforced to prevent fail failure. Here on the left side, we have an isometric view of the rocket showing the tepid di distribution. Now focusing on the nose cone on the right, on the tip of the nose cone is where the, the rocket experienced a high temperature of 507 Fahrenheit. Again, because of the the material selection that the nose cone is made out of, that it would not, it would not 
the, uh, it would not stop the, the rocket performing to its best of its ability. Now we have now looking at the fins. We can, the temp we can see the temperature distribution along the fin. The area of concern is where the fins and the fuselage meet, because that can cause the fins to fall off during flight, which would be a, which would stop the rocket performing to the best of its, of its ability. So we need to make sure that that location is reinforced to prevent that from happening. Next on the agenda is rocket stability, which should be taken over by Livio Campanato. Thanks, Dennis. Um, good afternoon, everyone. The stability of the rocket depends on two locations where external forces act on the body. The first location of consideration is the center of gravity. It is the point at which the average location of the weight can be found. Additionally, the resultant of the inertial forces also act through this point. Our team found the center of gravity using a solid works assembly provided by the Eagle Rock Club. The yellow blocks here are used to replace systems such as the parachute slash drogue, avionics system, payload, and propellant. To compensate for these systems weights, each system, each block was made of aluminum and sized appropriately to be uh, an appropriate placeholder. With the rocket fully loaded, the center of gravity was found to be 49.05 inches from the base. To find the location at burnout, simulate the loss of mass. With the propellant gone, the center of gravity moves forward about 5.5 inches to a location of 54.7 inches from the base. The second location of importance is the center of pressure. This is the point that contains the average location of pressure variation on the rocket. The aerodynamic force of lift and drag also act through this point and can, be, and can be seen just below the center of gravity. The center of pressure location was found using the Barrowman equations. These sort of equations may look complicated, but they only depend on geometrical features and dim dimensions of the components. Like calculating the center of gravity for each component, the center of pressure does this for each section of the rocket. There originally was an additional term for a conical section. However, we have omitted this because the rocket does not contain any conical transitions. In the locations of center of gravity and center of pressure, we can measure a rocket stability in terms of caliber. Caliber is a dimensionless term defined by the ratio of the distance between the center of gravity and the center of pressure to the diameter, which can be seen in the equation here. We tried our best to obtain a one caliber stability, which means the distance between the center of gravity and the center of pressure is one diameter length. In our case, about 7.5 inches. However, since the center of gravity moves forward towards the nose of the rocket, the caliber increases to a range of one to 1.75 calibers. Generally, a caliber below one can be, and as you move closer or higher than one, uh, there are chances that can lead to uh, weather copy. Next up, we have Christopher Merlos, who will cover costs and manufacturing. Uh, thank you, Livio. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So now uh, we move forward with the cost analysis of the rocket. Having chosen the Von Karman nose cone together with the taper swept fins, 
we now look at the materials that were used. So when we first look at the nose cone, uh, it's made from an aluminum tip and it's also made out of fiberglass. The cone being used for the rocket, uh, we bought it as one piece altogether. This option turned out to be a lot cheaper since buying the materials to make it would include buying an aluminum rod and then machining it down to the tip needed to fit the top of the rocket. Then fiberglass sheets would also be needed and the mold to create the rest of the cone. Not to mention you also need epoxy, which is a material that's used to strengthen the fiberglass and, and to make it more durable after it cures. The cost of this process is roughly around $286 in comparison to just buying the actual nose cone itself for a price of 168. Moving on to the fuselage, we're using blue tube. Uh, for those of you who might not know what a blue tube is, it's a fiberglass material made from vulcanized fiber. And then moving on to the fins, uh, the fins are made from aluminum 6061T6. Um, aluminum was used for both the fins and the tip of the nose cone since they both performed really well in terms of temperature. During flight, these components only reached half of their melting point. So on this slide, uh, the cost of the rocket can be seen broken down by the components as the nose cone, the fuselage, and the fins. The cost of making this rocket is roughly around $622. And the, the way to ensure that this price stays within that range, all components need to be made uh, in-house with equipment that is provided to the team. If, they, if these parts were to be manufactured by a professional manufacturing company, uh, the price would get really, really high and it'll get really expensive. And now to conclude our presentation with the conclusion, it'll be Lena Lado. Thank you, Chris. So for the conclusion, based on aerodynamic analysis, the Von Kármán nose cone and the taper swift fin were the best design. The nose cone tip is where the rocket experienced the maximum pressure and time pressure. Also, for the fin attachment area, that region is a region of concern due to high temperature. Stability margin, known as caliber, was calculated to be in the range of 1.0013 to 1.753. This shows that our rocket will be stable during the flight. And now, to further the rocket analysis, the wind tunnel experiment will be a great tool to compare the CFD analysis. Thank you. We open to questions. Uh, Pro Professor Thornborn, your mic is muted. I think we got a hand take over back, no? His mic is muted. I was just telling people to unmute their microphone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> muted. Yeah. Um, so thank you everybody for the, uh, for the presentation. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. If, uh, we can just, all you need to do is be sure that your microphone is unmuted and um, yeah. we'd like to go first. Uh, I have a question regarding the cost analysis. This is Alfonso. Um, can I see what components were included in the cost analysis? 
or yeah, what total? Okay. Uh, so I have, a, I have a question if I think Alfonso just wanted to see that. Yeah, so um, I have a question about the temperature that you found. Is that the air temperature or is that the temperature of the surface? And if it's the surface temperature, how long does it take to reach that temperature? As far as we know, this is just that's no, we know that that's the temperature of the surface in terms of how long it takes to to, to reach that temperature is, is something we needed. We needed more analysis that we were limited on 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 answers. So that's like a steady state temperature, assuming that the surface can like conduct heat away and radiate it. And I guess there's convection also. Yeah, I know in ANSYS there was a, another part of the simulations that we could have done to show to show how long it would take to heat okay. up. But it's something we we because the time constraint we were unable to do. And, and now is that Mach 2, right? Yes, it's a Mach 2. Okay. Okay. So um, I think that's, I'm just worried about, you know, things getting damaged, but I think that's probably fine because it will probably only be at that speed. If it hits that speed, it'll only yeah. be for you know, 10 seconds or something. To, to, add to, to add to it a little bit, um, considering that this simulation is at steady state, if if the rocket were to reach Mach 2, it, it wouldn't be long enough to keep that temperature um, at that magnitude for more than a few seconds. Um, and that just goes to, it depends on what sort of uh, motor you guys use if you decide to uh, increase the thrust or um, even lower the weight of the rocket. Other questions? I have one question. Uh, I see that uh, you guys uh, uh, you guys did a great job, and uh, your design uh, seems to me your design uh, guarantee kind of uh, low drag low drag force. By the way, especially at the circle, the red color you, you are showing right now, that area thin, thin and huge large that area. Did you, did you have any check uh, for the stress analysis before you purchasing the parts? We did do some stress analysis, but since this rocket is a simplified version of what the actual rocket would look, we mm -hmm. thought it, it wasn't an acceptable result if it wasn't the appropriate fin can, uh, fin can attachment that attached the fins mm -hmm. to that. So any deformation we would see from there, we kind of thought it would be not really true because the, the full assembly of the rocket isn't really, we didn't really test. Since we're limited on answers, the number of nodes and meshing, we just mm -hmm. decided to simplify it the most as we can. Uh, yeah, it seems to me the material you selected is, uh, I think, aluminum. Yes. But aluminum, the yield strength is a little bit lower than the stainless steel or other material. So, you have to check the stress analysis against the yield strength. Yes. I have more concern about the stability regarding the, it seems like the fin is very like a uh, narrow and it's a slip back. So have you done any like a vibration analysis because of the load that you're going to start vibrating it that will cause the stability of the hole in our yeah. rocket? Uh, one of the one of the things we were looking into, and I think you're referring to uh, fin flutter. Uh, yes. Essentially, yeah, where, where the wind um, vibrates the fin and then basically your tail section self-destructs. Um, we haven't really gone in, into that calculation yet. Um, as far as we know, the 
more stiff the fin is, the less of a chance there is of fin flutter happening. However, it also depends on how the attachment to the fuselage is, whether it be welded or bolted, because um, even that connection type, even if you have a stiff material, fin flutter can still take place. Yeah, I'm just talking about the, even not only a whole fin, but just tip of the fin start vibrating due to the like the high speed Mach or even the transonic area instead of reaching to the supersonic. Transonic is a very typical area that you can predict. So that's the place that you might consider any stability analysis due to the blurring of the fin and the, you know, so that's the only thing that I concern. I see. So, and um, also to add to what Livio said, uh, the diamond shape of the taper sweep fin will also uh, strengthen the strength of the fin in terms of uh, if the fin will break during the flight. Yeah, I'm sure it's not going to break, but it's going to start vibrating due to the deformation. It's going to interact with the structural damping and your aerodynamic, which we call aeroelastic phenomena. That kind of thing might happen to that very long, slender, and sweep back fin. That's all. Yeah. I, I, I want you to, you know, check, see if that is stable enough to prevent any fluttering and then destabilizing the whole rocket into the space. Well, from, from our initial, so um, as mentioned earlier, we did a, bit of a little bit of structural analysis. And, um, but the, the main assumption with that structural analysis is that the base of the rocket is completely fixed, one fixed support. Now, that may not be necessarily true when the rocket's assembled. But the deformation that we saw at the tip, um, I believe was in the range of, I wanna say- uh, Millimeters. No, it wasn't millimeters. It was way smaller. It was, uh, I'm trying to think of the number, 0. 0.0005 meters. So just like a 10th of a millimeter. That is which condition, like a hot supersonic conditions? Mach yes. Two? Yeah, that's that's taking into account at, at Mach 2. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, I have another Hi. question. Yeah, I've got a question. Uh, uh, so, um, so you centered down on aluminum as the as the tip material, but um, and I didn't see presented here, so it may be work that was done previously. But did you do any comparison work with uh, other materials, like you know, ablative materials or titanium or uh, other other metals like that? Just just as comparison. With um, regards to maybe. material, no, we didn't. Uh, we didn't uh, vary at the tip. Uh, our one of our bigger focuses was uh, the geometry, so the just the different shape. Material uh, was something we we switched out too much. Okay. You no, know, and our reasons for that just that yeah. aluminum tip was because that's how it sell on the market with the aluminum tip, because then that in terms of cost was more of our aim set to using aluminum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just just curious if that you know if there was a little wider, wider cast net of of uh, other material types or other approaches that just to kind of give you a thumbnail view of what uh, kind of what other areas might be worth investigating. There was somebody else that had a question. Uh, I have a question. This is a question to anybody in the group. What were our key takeaways from everybody? For the entire project, I think my key takeaway, I probably would never forget, is trying to learn ANSYS from scratch. Yes, that was a big learning process. Figuring out how to set up project conditions, making sure the re our modeling was correct. And I, know, I think that's a valuable thing I won't forget in all the hours and computational power, so 
that's my my big takeaway from this project uh for me it would be uh organize team organization and and time management i think those are two two very crucial things uh we don't work individually we work together so it the communication is like was one of the key things we had to we had to ensure couldn't fail because it was very it's just it was it was very difficult uh you know when one person thinks one way and the other thinks the other and making too many assumptions so to clean a lot of that up communication was key and time management yeah that was for me So for me as well, um, I would say time management and communication was um, one thing that was uh, big on this project because we have to to come up together and also with the situation that we are in right now, it wasn't easy to work uh, at the time that we wanted and also there's a there's uh, some part of the project that we wanted to do that we were not able to to do since we are we are at home right now i think um for me is that no matter how well you do at your project um you in reality you kind of only scratch the surface and the deeper you dive down the more questions you actually have because uh, everything gets really complex and um, yeah, it's just, it's a process where it, you need to constantly learn. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think for me, I would also agree with uh, Livio about just, just the, the, well, first the communication and it, it, it was tough uh, doing it the way we did it now with like being at home and all that stuff and trying to communicate with each other. Also, I think one of the biggest things was um, was having an idea and, and you know, you find so many sources that can, or you find sources that say, oh, you know, this is good, but you need to actually find like scholarly sources or, or people that like research, like the research behind it. It's, it's, it, it was tough to find things that would, that to do things that you wanted to do and have like other things that would back it up and say, hey, yeah, this is, this is, it just, like Livio said, like when you start looking into all the research that's done for stuff like this, it, it goes really far in into the minor stuff. Like just, it's really eye to detail. Okay, Michael Parvin, do you have your hand up or? Well, actually I have a general comment to make that uh, is probably uh, applicable to all the projects that were presented. Uh, in all, you know, these, you know, project and the, you know, there are, there are materials actually used. And I didn't hear or see any sort of criteria used to select material for that, you know, particular application. Obviously, I mean, cost is one of the de determining I mean, uh, criteria, but uh, depending on whether I mean, the part is on the you know, temperature, I mean, electrical current, I mean, this type of force, that type of force, and you know, subject to bending. And uh, there are uh, actually selection criteria that should be used to pick and combine actually all these, you know, the selection criteria because the part, I mean, maybe. Um, subjected to a wide range of you know these things, and uh, then combine them with the cost. There is a systematic actually methodology that would allow us to pick material you know out of several thousand available on the material. So I you know personally any in any type of design or anything, and then someone uses you know certain type of you know material. I ask why this material and not the other one. And the other one means that several thousand actually type of you know, materials. So this is, it is good actually to pay, uh, to be aware of this. And as I said, I mean, there are actually approaches. Uh, I have usually actually, I usually cover this in uh, material selection course and when I teach it. And uh, it is a very good method 
and uh, would let us actually select the best type of you know, material at lowest cost for that particular application. I just wanted to share my thoughts with you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree. Um, I think our biggest pitfall was um, we we were focused on primarily the simulation running um, that took you know the majority of our time. But you're absolutely right. Um, there needs to be more. Uh, thought into material selection. Okay, we need to wrap this one up. Let me thank the team for putting together an interesting presentation and thank the audience for the several interesting questions. Um, don't forget to fill out the Qualtrics survey. We certainly value your opinion and will provide some feedback to the students. Um, our next presentation is a self-leveling stand. Uh, it's a Boeing project, and I I know that at least some of the people are already in the way, are already in the room. Uh, okay, somebody's grabbing control of the screen. That's good. Great. So uh, we're right on schedule. Welcome to Expo. 2020. This is the last paper in the session this afternoon. Uh, this one, um, we expect the paper, the presentation to last about 20 minutes, but there'll be ample time after the presentation for questions and answers. Um, if, well, I welcome feedback from everybody. We've got a Qualtrics survey to fill out. Um, I've I'll post it in the link to that in the in the chat room, um, and then I guess without further delay, uh, welcome the self-leveling stand team. Go ahead. Oh, do we start right now? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Uh, we are the Team 14, the Automated Self-Leveling Stand. I am the team lead, Dustin Hong. And here in our group, we have Simon Levin, Nicholas Gerlitz, Andres Martinez, and Javier Lara. Here's our agenda for today and the topics we'll be going over and talking about. First, we'll go over the project background and a top-level work breakdown schedule that we've had for this year. Then we'll go but then we'll be going into our full scale design where we'll talk about our method of operations uh, as well as the benefits for this design in comparison to what we believe that our sponsors currently have. We then move on to our prototype scale design, going over the method of operations, build materials, a donation, and the benefits that our prototype may provide for the team once it has been constructed. Afterwards, we will talk about our, our technology demonstration and our software development that we have made through LabVIEW. And the last topic is the path forward. Here, I'll pass it off to Simon to talk about the project background and scope. Thank you, Dustin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Simon Levin, and the background of our project is the satellite components, such as reflectors and then deployment systems, are designed to operate under zero gravity conditions. These systems were not built to withstand forces induced by gravity. To simulate zero gravity conditions, Boeing is currently using a six degree of freedom support stand to manually offload the reflector's weight. The goal of this project is to automate the offloading process while maintaining the ability of handling excessive loads and potential overdriving of the system. The current offloading process can take anywhere from two to four hours. This will be accomplished by utilizing sensors and motors in conjunction with computer control systems to design a user-friendly, budget cost and time-efficient solution to the offloading process. I will now hand it over to my team member, Nicholas, who will be talking about the WBS. So for the WBS, if you can move on to the next slide. Oh, wait, this one. Thank right. you. Yes, and due to the depth of this project and what we have experienced throughout this year, we determined that this project will not be completed within a one-year time frame. Instead, we have divided up this project into three years. 
the first year focusing on design and validation of key components to our stand, such as pin detection and the start of our computer control system. The second year will be focused on fabrication of the prototype to further develop this computer control system. The third year will be to gather all the data and design elements of the first two years before and generate the full scale model, updating and refining the design from the tests produced by the second year. Moving on, I will start to talk about the schedule for this year at a top level. For the first semester, we started off conceptualizing the full scale design, trying to figure out how it all worked. We then moved on to creating a prototype design as a proof of concept, isolating key components needed for the computer control system. For the second semester, a method of operations for the stand was created to show how our stand will function. While the method of operations was being flushed out, we proceeded into talking to companies to obtain quotes for each component and any donations we can obtain to generate a bill of materials for the prototype design. And now I will pass it off to Dustin to talk about the functional group of the current self-leveling design. Okay, here we have our functional groups for our self-leveling stand. We currently have six functional groups in total. These groups are our mating interface, our mounting platform, translational function, height adjustment function, base, and our computer control system. As you can see indicated in the green right here, uh, this would be our main interface, which consists of our gimbal system. As you can see, the spherical joint right here, as well as the casing for it. Uh, we would like to have our main interface mounted onto the satellite reflector. Um, number two, which would be the mounting platform, as you can see is referenced to the white plate. In this case, it will consist of everything on the mounting platform, which are a four jaw self-centering chuck right here. Our pin detection system consisting of four distance sensors over here. Uh, a motor to automate the chuck right here. And our support struts to stop any other motion that may occur due to reflector. And they would be placed over here, here, and one in the back over here. Number three, our translational function would be our automated XY table that could be seen in the mustard color in this graphic right here, as well as a little bit over here. This would allow us to allow our stand to make any adjustments needed in the XY axes sent from our pin detection system in order to align ourselves with the center of our chuck with the center of our gimbal system. Number four is our height adjustment function, which is being fulfilled by our lifting column, as you can see in the violet pink color right here, as well as a little bit over here. Uh, this would allow us to automate any height adjustments needed in the Z axis. Uh, and then number five, which is our base, uh, also, which also provides a housing for our lifting column, which can be seen right here, as well as a little bit over there on top. This is the heaviest portion of our stand, which will help contribute to lowering the CG or the center of gravity of our stand. And lastly, we have our number six, our computer control system. This is not shown on the graphic, but provides one of the most important roles to this project. In order to automate all these processes simultaneously and sequentially, it will also provide a human machine interface in which we will be able, be able to interact and adjust any necessary settings to the stand needed. I will hand it back to Simon to talk about the method of operations. Thank you, Dustin. When looking at the method of operations, there are a total of 21 procedures. Box number one indicates that the tool was away from the satellite dish and has not yet been moved to its final position. Box number two illustrates that the computer control system is turned on. Box number three indicates that the system requires all components to send a signal of one to know that they are working properly. Box number four makes sure that the system has received the value of one. After the system has indicated to the technician that all elements are working properly, box number five directs the technician to transport the tool to the already lowered satellite dish. 
Box number six specifies that one of the six lasers will direct the technician to approximately center the tool underneath the satellite dish. Box number seven illustrates that the technician visually confirms that the tool is approximately underneath the satellite dish. For the next 10 steps, the automated process by the computer control system will be completed. Box number eight will have the jacks deployed to support the automated tool stand. Box number nine will have the lower jacks lock and secure. When these steps are completed, box number 10 will conduct the first height adjustment so that the pin is within the range of our pin detection system. Box number 11 will make sure that all of the four laser sensors scan and detect the pin. In box number 12, the pin has been located by the laser sensor and this information is relayed to the XY table. When this data is received by the XY table, Box number 13 will ensure that the XY table aligns with the center of our gimbal. The final height adjustment is completed and in box number 14, the mating sequence with the pin is achieved. When the pin is two to three inches inside the chuck, which is detected by the height sensor, the information is sent to the computer and this is demonstrated in box number 15. In box number 16, the chuck begins to close and, the secure, and secure the pin. In box number 17, the pin is then located and secured by the chuck to prevent further motion and restrain the pin to the tool. Now the technician can step in and perform the attaching of the struts and locking them in place as shown in box number 18. When these steps is performed, box number 19 shows that the balloon is then removed from the dish and in box number 20, the dish is removed from the satellite. Finally, in box 21, the satellite connected to the automated self-leveling tool is free to be moved and transported. Having gone over the full-scale model method of operations, I will now pass it over to my team member, Andres, who will be speaking about the benefits of the current design. Thanks, Simon. The main benefit our design brings is an overall reduction in time and man hours. This is mainly done by automating the mating process between the reflector and our support stand. Leveling with the current design is a tedious process. This is mainly because two three by five inch interfaces are being leveled to one another within two mils. Our design moves precision from the interfaces to our pin detection. Everything seen in green is being directly mounted to the reflector. The gimbal shaft that Dustin showed earlier is freely rotating and will hang normal to the ground due to gravity. Our sensors will locate the pin and calculate corrections needed with respect to height and translate accordingly to capture the pin with our automated chuck. Once we have secured the pin, our support struts are then installed, restricting the reflector from any movement or movement. Now, I will move on to the prototype scale and talk about the similarities and differences between it and the full scale model. So visually, as you can see, uh, it's very similar to the full scale. This is because we designed the full scale first and scaled down our requirements to create an easily manufactured prototype Removing the base was done to reallocate resources that would have gone into design and manufacturing. Instead, we plan to direct our attention to the automation and controls, which will be, the, which will be identical for both full scale and prototype. We will also reduce the precision requirements of our sensors, as you will see later in the presentation, since our pin detection works within the margin of error of an inexpensive sensor, it allows us to confidently procure high precision sensors. Now Simon will talk about the method of operations in regards to this prototype. Thank you, Andres. Having gone over the method of operations for the full scale model, and due to constraints, we've had to scale back and design the method of operations for the prototype. It is very similar except for boxes eight and nine, where the jacks are not being implemented due to our change in the base. Since the jacks are used to restrain the movement of the automated tool, the base for the prototype will be a tool cart with locking wheels, which will be satisfactory, but not as reliable as the jacks. I will now ask my team member, Dustin, to speak about the bill of material for the prototype. Okay, uh, here's the bill of materials. By the time of January, the team knew which items we, ha we would have liked to procure, but the team had soon come to realize that when automating multiple portions and functionalities of our stand, the individual components start to rapidly increase in price, becoming well over budget. As the team noticed this fact, the team had decided to refocus our attention towards constructing a finished bill of materials that could be talked about through CSULA and our sponsors, if they believe the project should go on to the next year. 
The components to the build materials is planned on being procured over the course of summer so that the next team will be able to construct our prototype model immediately. Uh, fortunately, there was a donation agreement that was shown in the build materials, which is this lifting column right here. The company TI Motion provided our team with a backlink program that would agree on having their lifting column becoming a donated asset towards CSULA's self-leveling team. The backlink program also includes the controllers to this lifting column, saving the team upwards of $4,000 in costs. This lifting column presented will be used for our prototype design. As you can see on the chart, it has a safety factor of 2.4 with a pushing and locking force up to 1,000 newtons, as well as having a minimum dynamic bending moment of 3,540 pound inch. I will now pass this back to Andres to talk about the benefits for our prototype design. Thanks. And the main benefit we expect to obtain from the prototype is validation of the design. We will be able to test all operating features of a stand with an emphasis on the electrical components. For the mechanical aspect, our focus will be testing the automated chuck and support struts. In theory, we designed the automated chuck to withstand most of the weight from the reflector and the support struts to stop any excess rotational motion. Testing this with scaled down requirements will allow us to prove our concept. For the electrical aspect, the critical path is showing that our pin detection can autonomously calculate and execute corrections. Um, I will now pass it on to Nick, who will talk about the components for the technology demonstration. Thank you. For the technology demonstration, the first component we'll be talking about is our gimbal system. On the top left, we are showing the um, two mating plates, and on the bottom left is the gimbal shaft. These are currently 3D printed using PLA. However, the final product will be either 3D printed in aluminum or machined to the specifications needed. Then in the center picture, there is our gimbal system fully assembled next to our pin detection system. The pin detection system consists of using four sensors, two in the X direction and two in the Y direction. The final components on the right are a chuck typically used on a lathe machine seen to grip the gimbal system and lock it into place. The XY table shown on the bottom right, which will later take distance inputs from our pin detection control system to adjust the stand as needed. I will now pass it on to Javier to talk about the pin detection experiment. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Javier Lara, and this is a pin detection experiment. As we mentioned before, it is done with four sensors, two pairs on the left side, which is one axis, and the back side, another two um, pairs, one pair, two, two more sensors. And since we're back there, the back sensors are 3.5 inches away from the pin, and the left-hand sensors are 4.5 inches away from the pin. In the bottom section, we can see that there's an Arduino, which is being used to transfer the signal and the power to the, to the transmitter receiver terminal for the sensors. In the next slide, I show some readings of the pin detection and the angle calculation. Since we're there, we can see that there is a 4.59 on sensor one, and sensor two is a 4.86. Sensor three is showing us a 3.89 and sensor four reading us 3.67. With that, we see the difference right to the left, and then we see the angle down, which is respectively to each axis. As we move forward, we see the tech demo that is representing that validation of the pin detection. And as mentioned again, it's done with four acoustic sensors, and the pin detection will give us feedback on the adjustments needed to be made on our XY table. And um, the validation of the pin detection will hold true due to the calculation um, because of the sensor reading. And it will be already within the theoretical margin of error. And we move forward and we see the block diagram, which is the graphical code of the first step to the automation of the problem that we're currently having. And forward, we see that the graphical code is giving us the ability to locate the pin and calculate the angle. And 
for the future, we would like to finish the software of the pin detection and also to develop the functions that will send the signal to the XY table, which will make us readjust to the um, desired um, measurements. Next, I'll pass it on to Dustin, which will talk about the path forward. Okay, uh, for our conclusion chart, path forward, we feel that we need an agreement on what it would mean if the project were to continue on for the next year. We've shown what we believe are the necessary components needed in order to construct the prototype and the tasks that are needed to be done in order for it to be successful. If there is a consensus for the scope of this project to continue with the build materials and tasks given, then we believe next year's team will be successful in constructing a functioning prototype. Um, and here, uh, I would like to say thank you and I apologize in advance if I mispronounce your names to our advisors, Mike Thorburn, David Scholler, Arnaldo Rendon, and our sponsors, Teal Mas Masri, uh, Jonathan Fish, Jonathan Sanabra, Jeff Iwasaki, CJ, Dr. Cameron Massey, Stephanie Collin, and last but not least, Carrie Lapanza. You've all have been a great help in giving us a wonderful learning experience. This concludes our presentation. Thank you for listening and are there any questions? Thank you team, uh, it was an interesting presentation. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, be sure and unmute your microphone. Hi, this is Theo. Hi, this is uh, Carl. Um, let's see, I guess I have the one question I have is, um, how, how dynamic is this auto leveler? Is it, is, I guess maybe the, what's the overall like time cycle to get through the, what was it, 21 steps of locating, centering, capturing, and, and lifting, for example? We see it happen within seconds. As okay. soon as you turn the computer on, the system will run through it and then by the time the computer is ready to go, the technician can move it and it will be a pr slow process, but it will, the time frame to what it is now will be greatly reduced. And, and, and so how, how, in, in terms of a practical application, how do you envision that this is implemented? Is it, is it uh, primarily during uh, like a test setup situation where you're going to set up for a deployment of an array or an antenna or something like that? Or will it be dynamic in that as the array is deploying, this mechanism is going to continuously search an auto level, uh, which is more the case? Uh, it's more, I believe it's more of the first case. So once the, I guess the antenna or the reflector is fully deployed, once it is all the way down in static, at a certain position, we then move in our stand, our te the technician will move it in, and then we uh, start up our self lulling where we'll be able to locate our pin relative mm -hmm. to our stand and to adjust accordingly. Okay, and then you basically try to achieve zero G environment. Correct. Okay. Uh, just a quick note, on page 23, I think the graphic got goofed up by the software, so you might wanna check that, uh, it displays, it looks better. It looks better now in this view, but it, when you first put it up, it looked like it was kind of squashed in there or something. Anyway, just a, a comment to you. Okay, Teo, I think you had a question. Yeah, I wanted to ask on the, uh, uh, there was a chart with the uh, joystick right there. Uh, go back one, well, okay. On the left hand side, uh, when I guess the shaft will be vertical or uh, you know parallel to gravity, but at what point do you close the top piece and how does that work? Is it manual or is there something that does it automatically? Um, sorry, could you repeat that question? It was a little hard to hear. Shaft? You have the two blocks holding it? Yes. Hello? Yes. So, uh, can you we, hear me? The volume is quite low on your side.
How about now? Yes. Okay. So my question was on the on the shaft. When when you have it, uh, I guess it automatically uh, is parallel to gravity. But at what point do you close the top and bottom blocks? And how does that work? Is it manual or is it automatic? Um, for the top and bottom blocks, these are already going to be closed and attached onto um, the reflector, as say. So this is already going to be connected to the reflector, all attached together um, before the satellite reflector is deployed. Okay. So it's all done manually, but it happens before our isn't, method of operations occurs. Isn't there play between the ball and the block to allow it to be uh, vertical or parallel to gravity? Um, there is a little bit of a gap. I believe we made it into a class four clearance, which is approximately um, 0.2 mils. So there, there will be a little bit of play. But so you're, you're counting on the three struts to hold it uh, in place then? Yes. Got it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Hey guys, this is Jonathan Fish. Go ahead, Jonathan. I was going to say, um, presentation-wise, uh, pretty good. I was going to say the one thing I was probably missing right up front, uh, for those who have never seen this before, aren't familiar, uh, would have been good to have some type of uh, overview of how the whole system worked from deployment to capture, self-leveling, all that kind of stuff together. Um, I think that could have cleared a lot of things up for some people. Okay, okay. The other thing is, um, I don't have it in front of me either, but we had a list of requirements, right, when this whole project started. Do you have somewhere that list and whether those requirements were met or not and why? Um, currently, you know, we don't have, we do have the list still, and we believe the requirements have changed over time as our design developed. Originally, what the design was, was that we had, two three by five interfaces one which was on the solid reflector and one that was on our stand and to get that uh to self level that uh three by five interface to the one on the reflector to a certain precision and that has changed ever, uh, ever so slightly as our design changed so uh we didn't really develop that chart where we checked off certain requirements and that we've met but we felt that as the design has uh, progressed, that we've met at least half the requirements. Okay, um, other questions? Okay, if not, well, thanks everybody for participating. Uh, thank you team for giving an interesting presentation. I certainly thank the, the Boeing clients for their involvement. Uh, it's important to the students. I'm sure that they benefited from your participation as well. Um, and this concludes our uh, session today. Uh, we, we have sessions all next week in the electrical and mechanical engineering area from from two until six. It's the same link that you got on to the meeting today. Uh, we certainly welcome your participation in those meetings as well. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mike. You. Okay. Good session. Thank today. you, guys. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks so Thank much. You.